Let us see. I think no intro tonight, guys. Well, happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to another live long care Q&A. My name is Ron Henry, and I am here to help answer your long care questions. Now, if this is the first time you're gracing us with your presence, welcome. We are super happy to have you here. Now, the way this works is really simple. On your screen, you will see a chat box. In that chat box, you can enter your question, concern, comment of the day, and I work through them in the order that they come in. Now, sometimes I have the answer, sometimes I do not. But either way, we have a great time talking about long care and sometimes life, you know? So, all right, so that's what we have in the live stream uh, this evening. As always, guys, we're coming to you guys live on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. For any of you guys that are tuning in on Instagram, you guys are not gonna be part of the primary feed, but still feel free to be part of the conversation. Drop your questions, comments in, and I'll bounce back and forth between YouTube and you guys to make sure you guys aren't left out, because we don't want anyone to feel left out in, uh, in, the, in the program. It's been an interesting week, guys. It's been a bit of a rough week, so I had some, some health stuff going on, but uh, you know we move on and we're here and looking forward to hanging out with you guys talking about turf grass and just seeing how, what your plans are for getting amazing, an amazing lawn in 2024. So you know, as far as updates go, um, did get the pre-emergent out, so my pre-emergent is down. I, uh, you get, for you guys that, that, um, that follow the content, you know there's a couple different ways you can apply pre-emergent. Uh, I tend to go with the liquid route, so I use the prodiamine in a water dispersal granule. And with that, you can, on Bermuda grass anywhere, on all grass types really, but with Bermuda grass, you can either do a single application at the higher application rate, or you can split it up and do an application now, and then again another one in like say late March, um, early April timeframe. I am someone that has opted in years past, and this year is no different, to do the single app at the uh, at the higher rate. So that's what I did. It's done. So I, I am pretty much done with pre-emergent until the fall. Looking forward to the lawn staying weed-free. And, uh, you know, I put together a piece of content that um, 
once I get through editing, you guys will be able to to see, to be able to watch. So, you know, some of you guys have been asking for a new video on pre-emergent, so it's been a while since I did one, so we're gonna get one done. So hopefully you guys uh, enjoy it as much as I had fun making it. All right, so let's see what we have in the live stream this evening. We got Jason Harrison is in the house. Jason says, maybe the groundhog was right. I'm starting to see Bermuda Sprigs. Very few, but they are there. Only time will tell if winter lets them live or not. Yeah, man, I, I have to agree with you. You know, we it got warmer, then it got colder, and now it's kind of trending towards warmer again. So we'll, we'll see. Uh, to your point, when I was out in the lawn, I did see some green, like, peppered all throughout the dormant grass, which is good. It's a great sign. You know, we're still, you know, we're into the first week of February or second week of February. So, you know, to, to think that we were not going to have any more cold snaps between now and springtime is really, really wishful thinking. It likely is going to get cold again, but at least we're moving on the, the right trend, right? We're moving towards warmer weather. Bermuda's starting to respond. And I am, I'm looking forward to it. The big thing is if you're in the Southeast United States, you know, along the Gulf Coast, Florida, uh, Georgia, Mississippi, you know, Texas, if you're in South Carolina, North Carolina, like, I mean, it's, it's not a bad idea to consider getting your pre-emergent out. As always, and again, I say this every week and it's not like a broken record this time of year, every year, but a little bit early is better than a bit late when it comes to pre-emergent. So if you're on the fence about getting your pre-emergent out, get it out. If you really want to, you know, be super pedantic and want to make sure that you've got you got you know, as good coverage as possible. You could do a split application now and then another one again. Like I said, in late March, early April timeframe to help extend that coverage if you if you want to. So good stuff. But yes, Jason, fingers crossed for warmer weather. Ready to get out there and start going. I got my mowers back and uh, yeah, looking forward to to getting out there and and getting it done. Right. All right. So next up, we have a. Um, a question here from Instagram from Sir Amazing. Okay. He says, Bermuda grass, I have tons of weeds. Where do I start? Should I dig up the top turf? Yes, yeah, so if you have Bermuda grass and you got weeds, the, the good thing is, is that there's there are a lot of great options for controlling weeds in Bermuda grass. I can tell you a couple of my favorites, the ones that I, I'm a big fan of because I like the results you get with them, and that you can use these particular herbicides. Um, now when temperatures are milder all the way into summer months when temperatures are hotter and, you know, as far as the, the chance of you having injury to your grass, as long as you, you follow the recommended rates is very minimal. So there's two herbicides for Bermuda grass that make up, you know, the combination that is my personal favorite when it comes to broadleaf weeds. And you'll know you have broadleaf weeds because the weeds are not going to be you know fine. Like grass they are going to be, as the name kind of implies broadleaf. So like your, your, um, spurge, henbit, uh, those types of weeds. Um, for that, you would use a herbicide called Celsius. This is the bee's knees. This guy does a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, you know, if I, I did a video several years back and I said, if I could only have one herbicide for warm season turf, just one, it would, um, it would probably be this. It'd probably be Celsius. You know what I mean? As far as post-emergent herbicides go. So Celsius, you're going to want to stack that with surfactant for best results. So this is like the helping hands, so like Batman and then Robin to help support, to help support that you get great results when it comes to using um, Celsius. Uh, so this is what I would go with as far as for dealing with broadleaf weeds. Now, if you have sedges, so like Kalinga, po, um, Kalinga, um, nut sedge, globe sedge, yellow sedge, like all, all the different types of sedges, in addition to Poannua, which is a, um, it's a grassy looking weed. It's got like white seed heads that come up in the middle. Um, what you're going to want to use for that is a herbicide called Certainty. So the nice thing is, is that these guys can be mixed and sprayed together at the same time. The nice thing about both Celsius and Certainty is that neither of them have any temperature restrictions. So again, you could apply them now and also as temperatures get warmer and still get good control over weeds in your Bermuda, Zoysia, um, St. Augustine lawn. So it's pretty much all warm season grass, you're good to go with the exception of Bahia grass. If you have Bahia grass, you don't want to use Celsius on it, but for everything else, um, you're, you're good to go. So this combination is what I would use and I would make sure I use um, surfactant along with it. That should do a great job um, making a big dent in cleaning up the weeds that are in your Bermuda grass lawn. Um, and I haven't seen your lawn, I don't know how bad it is, but which, what I would say is you do an application, you know, let, let things ride for three weeks or so and then see how the, how the weeds are responding. And you may have to, depending on how bad the infestation is, you may have to do another one. The thing that, that's going to be nice, right, is that if you get the weeds under control, you've been, been knocking them back. Um, when the Bermuda wakes up here in another month or so and really begins growing, uh, 
you know, you're, you're setting things up to where it can become the dominant plant in your lawn. So you injure the weeds, you knock those back, and that gives your, gives Bermuda a headway to be able to take off and, and you know, along with, with a good nutrient program and regular mowing to really take off and spread and, and become, you know, the, the one plant that you have in your lawn, right? So, you know, because the weeds are going to be gone. So hope that helps. As far as you can get this stuff, I will send you a link here on the Golf Course Lawn Store. If you go to just golfcourselawn.store to search Golf Course Lawn, like one of the first things that will come up will be the Golf Course Lawn Store. If you go to shop and then weed killer, you'll see where you can find Celsius and certainty. Or if you want, there's a kit that we offer that has Celsius certainty, surfactant, and a dye, like a blue marker dye so you can see where you've sprayed. So I'll link that here in the chat for you now, and then you will be on your way, sir. And the nice thing about that, I mean, depending on the size of your lawn, you know, this will do two acres or 90,000 square feet. So you're going to have plenty for like years and years. And then this will do, depending on the application rate, an acre or a bit more. So again, you know, you're talking 45,000 square feet with this one and um, 43,000 square feet with this one and, you know, close to 90,000 square feet with, uh, with, with this one. So you've got plenty of product. Um, so when you get it, you're going to be, you're going to be good to go for a, a long period of time. So I hope that helps. I'll revisit your other question. So you have another question here about nutrients. I'll come back to it, I promise. But let me jump back over here to YouTube and see what other folks have. Thanks for the question. I will, um, I'll come back to you. All right. All right, so next up, we have Papa Moslow. Papa Moslow is in the house. He says, hello, Ron and fellow Grassaholics. You know, I resemble that comment, Papa Moslow. Grassaholics, I like it. He says, no questions, just listening in tonight. Touch the like button on your way in. Yes, guys and gals, we've got 83 people here in the live stream so far, only 33 likes. Surely we can do better than that. So if you guys are enjoying the content, I realize it's a bit new and early, but if you guys want to support the channel in a way that costs you absolutely nothing, hit that like button and I would really appreciate it. It sends great vibes to YouTube and, you know, gets folks to come over and makes it just more, more of a fun party, right? Which is always good. Who looks, everyone likes to party. All right. Uh, next up is Mr. Tom Hoffenkamp. He says, happy Friday, Ron and fellow lawn enthusiasts. Got my golf course lawn store sold test kit back and all is well and set for 2024. Yes, I like it. I'm hoping and praying that groundhog is right. Let's go. Let's hope, man. Let's hope we get a warmer spring. Last year, it threw us threw us for a curve. Like We started out nice and warm. And then if you guys remember, like the third week of March, it went down like into the low 30s and Bermuda was like, oh Lord, what is this? You know, it really, really did a number on a lot of the lawn. So hopefully we don't get that this year. And Tom, again, I want to give you a special thanks. Um, so guys, you guys know I put out blog content. Um, I try to do something every single week and I had a, a, a small typo in one of the articles and Tom caught it and he emailed me and says, hey man, you know, I just wanted to let you know, I really enjoy the content, but there's, you know, I think you meant to say this, this isn't, this, you know, this isn't actually, isn't actually correct. And I was like, thank you. I, I really appreciate you reaching out to me. So, um, you know, I, there's, you guys have, have no idea like how much work goes into making all this stuff work. So I really appreciate one that you guys actually read the content. And when, if you find something that could be said a little bit better, or if I make a mistake somewhere, feel free to reach out to me and let me know. And I will, I will most, you know, I'll definitely correct it. So I appreciate that, Tom. Thank you so much for, um, for doing that. And, uh, again, yeah, good, you know, good job on getting your soul test done. And I'm glad that your lawn is in great shape. Your soul is in great shape, ready for 2024. Don't dominate too hard. You know, don't flex too hard. You know, make sure, make sure, you know, you, you dominate humbly. Like the neighbors next door, when they come over and they ask for help, don't give them the, oh, I don't know. I just water it and I mow it every now and then. It just looks like that. Make sure, you know, give, help them out. Don't, don't just, don't be one of those folks that hoard all the information now that you're in the know. All right. Okay. Next up is Jay Bear. He says, let's go. What's going on, Jackie? Thanks for coming to hang out, sir. I appreciate you. And then Vahid Navi saying, hello, everyone. What's going on, uh, Vahid? Appreciate you coming to hang out in the live stream. And then next up, we have a question. Again, we're going back to the gram. I can tell it's going to be a late tonight. tonight. I can feel it. It's going to be a long night. This one going back to the gram. He says, um, are there asking about nutrients? Next would be nutrition for Bermuda grass. Yeah. So uh, we have a, a free lawn care calendar. We have one tons of articles about taking care of Bermuda grass, all kinds of all types of grass types on the golf course lawn store. And there's tons of articles on fertilization. Um, so you can always check that out. If you go to the golf course lawn store and then the resources and blog, there's like tons of content on there. Like the piece of content that was, that was um, released this week is around like lawn care tools. Because some of you guys say, hey, what should I have? You know, people that are new anyway, they say, what kind of tools should I have for getting my lawn ready for the 2024 season? So it's one piece of content that we didn't have. So I'll show you guys. If you go to resources and then blog, there are 14 essential lawn care tools 
for your yard this season. And of course, first and foremost is the mower. And we just keep working through, you know, talks about the different types of mowers, while real mowers are awesome, you know, all, all that jazz. And um, it uh, talks about just, just different tools, string uh, string trimmers, uh, soil test kits, you know, kind of like what, to what Tom's already done, what aeration can do. Like just talks about all the different processes that you can you can follow to, to that I think put make, make for a great lawn. As far as your question on Instagram around um, a lawn care schedule, around a fertilization schedule, I can share with you, which is kind of a, 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 um, a more generic version of what we offer in the Golf Course Lawn Academy in our paid course. So if you go to resources and then lawn care schedule, and then click the fifth option, which is monthly application calendar, right? So again, this is free for you to look at. Um, it's starting in February, it talks about scalping, doing a soil test. Um, it, it gives you a month by month breakdown of what um, of what I do on my lawn, what I teach in the Golf Course Lawn Academy, and it covers you from February all the way through November. So take a look at this. I mean, read through it. There's a lot of supporting content that goes along with it. And if you have questions, you can feel free to reach out. Um, you can use this as a great template for building out your program. I mean, people people follow this. I have hundreds of people that follow this, and you know, I get. If you look at some of the, if you watch the live stream, there's people that, that send content all the time saying, but you know, they went yard of the month and just, they love how their turf looks. So the program absolutely works. It's just a matter of, you know, if that's, if it's a fit for you based on the amount of time you have and, you know, budget and, and that type of stuff. So hope that helps. I will, um, I'll put a link to that in the chat for you here on Instagram. I'm not sure if it's going to be clickable for you, but you can, you can give it a go. Um, so right here is, um, is where you could find that, uh, that calendar. So. Hope that's useful. Need anything else? Don't hesitate to reach out. All right. All right. So next we have Mr. David Eccles. Good question. Our first question of the evening, our second or third question of the evening, but first one really about a specific weed. So David Eccles asks, hey, Ron, what is the best thing for treating POA? I'm starting to see a little bit come in. I am in Noonan. Thanks, David. Great question, David. So the, the best way to treat POA is to prevent it in the first place using pre-emergent. You're in Noonan, you're in Georgia, so I'm assuming you have warm season grass like Bermuda. So it's too late this year, but for next, for, for this fall, so late August, early September timeframe, considering investing in a bottle of Spectacle Flow, this is, in my opinion, the best pre-emergent for keeping POA annua out of warm season grass. So this is going to be your, your, your sidekick. This is gonna do the, most of the heavy lifting for keeping POA out of your lawn. Now, you already got it in your lawn because you wouldn't be asking, so you probably got a problem. You're wondering how can you take care of it? As far as a post-emergent herbicide for dealing with POA annua in Bermuda grass, in warm season turf, right? So Bermuda, Zoysia, St. Augustine, warm season turf only. Um, you can go with a product called Certainty. This is an excellent herbicide for controlling uh, POA in warm season turf. The rates that you have to use with it are a bit higher, but it does a great job cleaning it up. So as far as um, rates go, you know the, the label the thing with, with with certainty. It's not just for POA annuate. It's it primarily it's for sedge control, but it does a great job against POA. So on the label, whenever you read it, you're going to see an application range of 1.25 ounces per acre up to two ounces per acre. What that equates to, you should ask yourself like, I don't have an acre. How much? What are we talking about here? Right? How do I? How do I? How do I measure that out? Take take an acre and like make that into like residential lawn speak, right? So what that works out to is you're gonna, it's going to come with a measuring spoon that looks like this. You're going to have a big end and a small end. And for Poanua, 1.25 ounces per acre works out to one of the large scoops. I've tested that, and again, this is I've, I've tested it a couple of times, and what I find is that the low the 1.25 ounces per acre will work well if you're dealing with young Poanua, like like stuff that's just just barely starting to grow. Like that will do the trick. If you have somewhere it's it's you know it's more mature, maybe it's even starting to, to potentially flower. Um, what I would say is you're going to want to use one large scoop, so one of these large scoops, and then one or two of the small scoops. That's going to work. That's going to set you between that 1.25 ounces per acre, which is the, the base rate, um, between that and the two ounces per acre. So if if you decide to go with um, certainty, there is guidance on the label, specifically speaking at Poanua. Um, so read that. Just know you got to bump the rate up, and, and this is very effective against it. The only thing I would say is combine certainty along with surfactant. This is going to help the herbicide adhere and spread on the, the leaf of the uh, of the poanua. It's going to help you get a better result. And um, and then once you apply it and spray it, just, just wait. 
You know, it's a great product. It's um, excellent for controlling POA in warm season turf. And we're very fortunate that we have, and for those of us that have warm season lawns, because we have a selective herbicide that that can control it without without breaking the bank. You know, it's not inexpensive, but as far as, you know, as far as um, like what some of the cuisine folks have to pay for herbicides that can potentially do some work against POA, certainty is uh, is a bargain. So I'll, um, I'll get you some links to where you can pick that stuff up. Um, David, you can find them under the weed killer section of the golf course lawn store, both the certainty and the surfactant. You can get them both there. So I'll link that in the chat now for you. So David... Eccles, I'll just say this, um, certainty herbicide. How about that? It makes it easier. Uh, answer fact. Uh, you guys will hopefully forgive me if there's any typos in my spelling. All right, so there you go. So um, there is where you can pick both of those up and that will do the trick as far as cleaning up the POA in your lawn. All right, so we have a super chat, guys. Our first super chat of the evening, Mr. Ted Rogers. Thank you so much, Ted. You're still rocking the mole, huh? You're not gonna let that go. I mean, I have one mole, well, not one mole, but I have a mole in my lawn, and you guys just, I mean, it's gonna be the perma avatar, I see. All right, well, thank you for the super chat, Ted. Super chat received. He says, my man, I have a few small bare spots in my front and side yard. Should I put seed down uh, and only use tenacity or starter fur with the pre-emergent in it? Um, my five-day average soil temps in, is 43. I know I have a little time to get it. I figure to get it figured out. Thanks. Yeah. So if you're going to, if you want a, I mean, if you want it to to have some control of weeds in those and those bare spots, but it's still allowing you to seed your lawn, Ted, then tenacity is a good option. I mean, it's not. Tenacity isn't a traditional pre-emergent in the sense of like, you're gonna get the kind of control or the longevity like you get out of like Spectacle or Prodiamine or Dithiapyr. Um, but as far as using it in, as part of a seeding project, it's it's excellent for that. So uh, so yeah, I mean, it's probably a bit cool um, for you to get great germination if you were to try it now. I might I might give it another couple, a week or two, you know, just let temperatures get a little bit warmer. Uh, but yes, you know, um, tenacity to control the weeds and then to and then a starter for it and some seeds to to, to jump start things and I think you're you're going to be on your way. Um, yeah, I think that's a, sounds like a, a solid plan, Ted. I don't um I don't see any any issue any issues with that. One thing I'd say is that the the spots that are bare were they do they have grass? And obviously we're not talking back and forth. So you can't answer me, but the the spots that are bare was there grass there before or? and they just maybe got damaged during the cold weather, or was it, has it always been bare? Like I know you did a, a renovation project last year and the lawn grew in pretty nicely from what I can remember. So this is, are these just areas that it just never grew in at all, or it was an area that looked good. And then, you know, winter snow did some damage to it and you're just trying to recover it. So it'd be interesting to know which, which of the two it is. If it's the, um, if it's from, from the winter weather causing the damage, then yes, I'm all I'm all for this as far as like helping the lawn recover. If the if the grass has never grown there, you might want to do some detective work and try and figure out why. Maybe it's not getting enough sunlight, there's some debris, there's something something going on. But you know, if if um that's the thing I would look at. If the grass has never grown there, I would put some time into figuring out why it didn't take. Because from what I remember about your lawn care project, it um your seeding project, it worked out pretty well last year. So hope that helps, sir. Thank you so much for the super chat. I really do appreciate it. And because you are our, our first super chat, um, you are now the show sponsor. So let me get that taken care of, Ted, before I get too far down the road. You know how I am. I get to gabbing and I forget stuff. And then you guys are like, man, how come? You know, I thought, I thought we were boys. What's up? And uh, so I'll take care of that now. So there you go. Your name in lights whatever that means to you. Hopefully it was helpful. Hopefully the answer was helpful and look forward to seeing how your lawn is, does this year, man. I know last year you put a lot of work in, so I am, I'm stoked to see how it, uh, how it comes out with, uh, now that you're, you're, you're further down the path, you know, you're further down the path and, and you can, you already know what you're doing and, and, and we, it'll be interesting to see how the lawn, how the lawn does. So keep up the great work. If I can help with anything else, definitely don't hesitate to reach out. All right, next up is Brandon Kennedy. And I like this, Brandon. He says, hit that like button on the way in. I appreciate that, Brandon. Definitely hit the like button. It's a great and free way to support the channel, support the content, let YouTube know that you guys are having a great time. So yeah, do that if you've not done so as yet. Mr. Darren Proctor is here. He says, good evening or good afternoon, everyone. What's going on, Darren? And then next up is Kurt Johnson. He says, I didn't put out pre-emergent. Should I put it out now? It depends on where you are in the country, Kurt. So the, the most correct answer as far as when to apply pre-emergent is you want to apply it before 
the average soil temps are in the mid 50s. So, and again, the keyword is before then, because at 55 degrees is when weeds like po like poenia, when weeds like crabgrass begin germinating. So, you know, for me, whenever the average soil temps are in the high 40s, low 50s, that's when I get my pre-emergent out. You know, a bit early is better than a bit late. It's not too late to do to do yours, depending on where you are in the country. I mean, if you are in New York, then it's probably too early. If you're in Georgia, you should get it out. You know, so it depends on where you are. You didn't tell me where you are in the country, but if you are somewhere where the temperatures or the winter is milder, then absolutely getting your pre-emergent applied is a is a great idea. Because I gotta tell you, man, like a bag of pre-emergent or a bottle of pre-emergent is far less expensive than having to go after weeds that are growing in with post-emergent herbicides. And it's just less time consuming, right? Even if you already got, so you already have Celsius certainty, you already have the, the stuff you need to be able to take care of the weeds. It's just your time. You don't wanna get out there and, and have to be spraying weeds and you know then you'll have parts of the lawn where the weeds are dead, so it's discolored, doesn't look as nice. It's just, just kind of a hassle. So pre-emergent is a great tool for doing the most of the heavy lifting for keeping your lawn weed free. So not too late at all, Kurt. If you should do it now or not, depends on where you're in the country. And again, the average um, five day soil temps is what you're gonna wanna use as your guide. If you're in the Southeast, I would say yes, I'd get your pre-emergent out. In my area, in Northeast Georgia, they were putting out pre-emergent in mid-January. So like three weeks ago, the, the, the pro services were out here spraying lawns already. So uh, you're, not, you're not ahead of the curve or you're not too early if that's what you're worried about. All right, let's see here. Um, next up, we have uh, Brandon Kennedy. Let's see here. He's <laughs> it's funny. He says, "Can y'all feel that in the air um, here in um, Helena, Alabama? My Bermuda is already starting to peak through. Ten percent green up. Look at you. Where's the rest at, baby? Let's go. Hey, listen now, Brandon. Here's the thing, man. I appreciate the enthusiasm, but I just I want to level set you because we could still get a cold snap." And then that 10% could become 3%. So I just, you know, I, I, it's still the first part of February. So even though you're 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 trending in the right direction, you know, don't be surprised if you get a little bit of knockbacks here throughout the, you know, between now and you know mid March. So just, I, I feel you, but I'm just saying that it's it's not it's not time to to uh, to to do the victory dance in the end zone just yet. We're not quite there just yet. But you know, fingers crossed that your lawn does well. All right, we have another super chat. This one is from uh, Mr. James Smith. James Smith is in the house. Uh, let's see here. Thank you so much, James. Super chat. He says, hello, Ron and everyone for that one acre application rate. Remember there's 43,550 feet in an acre. Yeah, it's funny, I've seen 550, I've seen 560, but yeah, 43,500. So yeah, a bottle of, of certainty is gonna cover a lot. And a bottle of Celsius, even a bit more than a lot, right? Depending on the rates that you're using. So. Appreciate that. Appreciate the super chat, uh, James. Thank you for all um, el amor and support. And uh, next up is Mr. Jimmy uh, Miller. He says, evening, Ron. Have you had a chance to look at my email and the question I have for tonight? Yeah, I saw the email, Jimmy. It was a pretty like long and extensive email. I did see that you had a tree cut down. Um, and the one thing I saw out of it, you had a tree in the middle of the yard and then you had it cut down. And the one thing I would say is that they didn't grind the stump. So you're gonna have issues with grass growing around that. So I have a picture of it. I have one of the pictures you sent me. So let's see here. This is the, this was the aftermath of the tree being cut down that you sent, uh, Jimmy. And like, you, you wanna get rid of that. Like, you know, whoever did it, or if you have to do it after the fact yourself, you want that, if you wanna, if the goal is to grow grass in that area, you're gonna to wanna to get rid of the, the the tree stump and as much as the roots that are branching off of it as you can, because just having that there, uh, you're, you're still gonna find, you're still gonna to, going to have some struggles with getting the, the grass to grow in. I mean, mowing around, it's gonna be a pain because it looks like I see some roots exposed there. So while getting the tree cut down to allow more sunlight to hit that area is good, like that's, that's definitely a good step, I would say the job is not done, right? Because you're, you're still going to have issues with the grass being thin in that area until that stump is ground and you get, again, you get, you get it removed as much as the roots that are near the surface, get all that stuff out. Um, and that's going to put you in a much better spot as far as, um, as, as far as just getting grass to grow in that area. You know what I mean? So I hope that is helpful, sir. Uh, next up, we got I Cut Grass LLC. Uh, let, let's see, it rubs the lotion on his... Uh, okay, I'm not sure what the question is there, so I will, it's not really a question, I'll skip that. All right, so next up is Kevin uh, D. Jones. He says, 
this is it's an impossible question, unfortunately. He says, um, what, hey Ron, it's been a while for me. I was wondering what would be your suggestion to spray out some common Bermuda in my hybrid lawn since it's now dormant and easy to identify? I mean, here's the thing. Even if you try and get rid of it, Kevin, it's unlikely that it's that it's gonna stay gone. If you've got like a patch of common and it happens to be growing, but the hybrid isn't, I mean, you could you could go after it with some like a, a combination of glyphosate and fusillade, like limit it just that area. But it's I'll be honest with you, um, you know, you're unlikely to get all of it. You're unlikely to get all of it. The thing that I've seen that I found that that works is if you can. Um, if you can, when the lawn is actively growing, right? So you're out there, you're mowing it and everything. If you can use a growth regulator, use something like Primo, um, that will mask, and you're mowing, you're mowing regularly, that will help mask a bit like how much the common shows up in the hybrid lawn. Because what you find is that I find that common Bermuda grows faster. It grows, it grows a bit more aggressively and, and just, just stands out more so in a hybrid lawn than the hybrid does. So if you can limit how quickly it grows, if you can slow down the growth rate of it, couple with regular mowing when the grass is you know, again, we're talking about when it's when it's already greened up. You will still see it, but as far as it's sticking out, someone like driving by and looking at the lawn and be like, oh, there's something different with that part of the lawn. It's not gonna stick out or not gonna show up quite as much than if you did not have the lawn under regulation. So something to consider, you know, if you want to consider going after it with again some um, you know, some glyphosate and and fusillate, you can, but I I kind of have a hard time, you know, believing that the the common is like woken up to where like the the, the herbicides are going to be effective against them because the, the grass actually needs to be growing um, for it to really for it to really work its, its best. Um, yet the hybrid isn't. You know what I mean? So it's it's up to you if you want to give it a shot. You can, but as far as removing hybrid or removing hybrid Bermuda from common or common from a hybrid or, or vice versa, it's just not um it's not an easy task. It's not not something that you can selectively do um, as as far as that goes. So sorry to have a better answer for you. But um, but yeah, I mean, if you want to try it, go for it. I, I, I again, I don't, I have a hard time believing that that, that, that either that the common is growing enough now that you're really going to get a great result. But if you want to try it, you, uh, you absolutely can. Something to consider is that if you try that and it doesn't work, and you want to, to like a, a way to help mask it a bit, again, consider using Primo. Consider using like a growth regulator. Again, you will see it because you're you look at the lawn all the time. You know what to look for. But for the average person looking at the lawn, it's not going to stick out quite as much than if you didn't have the lawn under uh, under regulation. So hope that helps. And uh, yeah, I mean that's that's the next that's the next big thing, right? To to solve like how to selectively remove common from hybrid. That would be that would be a great herbicide. If someone comes up with that, um, they're going to do quite quite well. So start to have a better answer for you. Uh, Kevin, but hopefully it gave you some tips to kind of get you on your way as far as um, as far as ideas go. All right, so next up we have um, actually I want to show you guys that guys. So so one of the questions um, you know folks have as far as like hey you know why do you got you like mow dormant grass and why do you turf rake dormant grass? It's kind of pointless. You know it's kind of uh, what's a waste of time. So one of the golf our golf course salon academy members, Justin, um, he. Still, he's kind of crazy like me, maybe even a little bit more so. And he, you know, he still mow, every now and then he gets out there and mows his lawn when it's dormant. He get turf rakes it, and makes it look, make it all, makes it look all nice. And for that, which again, you know, it's it's during the winter time, so I would say the bar is probably a little bit easier. But you still got to recognize it, right? A win is a win is a win. So my man, even with dormant. Bermuda grass got, you can see that? He got yard of the month. And the stripe actually is looking fire, man. You gotta admit, for dormant grass, that looks clean. Stripes are looking good. Um, it looks like he was working on like a diamond pattern, but it doesn't look like that's burning quite that well, but it was it was enough. It was enough to pull off the win and clinch him yard of the month. So congratulations. Congratulations, Justin. Nice work. We can show all those folks that make fun of us that dormant grass can look good, even to the point of winning yard of the month. So keep it up. All right, uh, next up is uh, Sir Amazing. He says, uh, nutrition for Bermuda, please. Uh, so what I have is a, we have a spoon feeding program that we like to do, um, Sir Amazing. There's there's tons of different ways of going about it, right? There's some people that will fertilize their lawn once per month with a granular fertilizer and call it good. Uh, the best results that I have 
um, I've seen when it comes to taking care of Bermuda grass is to do a combination of granular and liquid fertilizer. So you use a granular fertilizer once per month to do most of the heavy lifting, and then you spray liquid fertilizer twice a month at low rates. And what that does is you get more consistency in growth and color. And so as far as nutrition goes, as far as the amount of nitrogen going into the lawn using this, this, um, this, this strategy, you end up around seven tenths of a pound of nitrogen. So um, it's all laid out in a blog post that I have on spoon feeding. I will link it to you here in the chat. It's too much to kind of go into here, but I mean, in that blog post, it talks about application rates, products, like all that jazz. So if you read through that, it's gonna put you in a good spot to be able to put together a nutrient program. Like what I'm suggesting for you absolutely works great, produces a good result, um, but then you can take that, run with it, and make adjustments as you see fit to, um, to, to have a program that's, that's customized for what you want to do, right? All right, so I'll show you here really quick. Here on the Golf Course Lawn Store, I think it's now we're on page four. Yep, page four. Um, the article on why you should start spoon feeding your lawn, it talks about the benefits. Like this is a picture of my lawn from last year using this program. So if you like how that looks, you can, and you have a real mower, you can make your lawn look like that. And uh, it talks about um, the role of the granular fertilizer, the, gran the role of the liquid fertilizer, um, talks about the products that I use, and then I also application rates. So if you get further down here, I talk about like spreader settings and application rates and what you're trying to achieve by using a combination of granular and uh, liquid liquid uh, products. So I'll link that to you here in the chat. I'll link it for both of you guys. So folks here in, folks here that are in uh, the YouTube, on YouTube will we'll have, I'll give it to you guys here. And then also for this person that's on, on uh, on the gram, I'll I'll hook you up as well. Um, so there you go. This is the spoon feeding program in a nutshell. And here you go, um, sir, amazing. So there's your uh, there's the the article on that. And again, you can find all this on the Golf Course Lawn Store. Just go to resources and blog. If you're scrolling through, it's going to be the fourth page is where that that lives. So hope that's useful for you. All right. And next up, we have um, Jimmy Miller saying. Uh, Oh, here's hoping we don't have a repeat of last February. Yeah, tell me about it, man. We definitely don't want to get cold and warm and bounce back and forth again. I'd rather just kind of slowly warm up versus bouncing, kind of pugging back and forth. But, you know, Mother Nature always has has uh, her way. So we'll just see. We shall see. All right, let's see here. Next is uh, Noak95. He says, uh, greetings and salutations. I went a little wild this year and set my dormant lawn on fire and <laughs> how to see the results. It can work. I mean, it, as far as a way of, of cleaning out debris in your lawn is kind of giving it a reset for the beginning of the season, burning your lawn is absolutely a strategy. A lot of HOAs don't, uh, don't allow it, don't allow you to set your lawn on fire. So before you go out and do that, make sure that you're not going to get, you know, get encounter any trouble by, um, by going that route. Make sure you like you make sure you put down a good water barrier around so she doesn't spread anywhere else, like into other neighbor's lawn and that kind of thing. But if you if you want to do that, there's people that that have done it and the lawn recovers just fine. Um, so it's, it's up to you. You've already done it. And I guess just keep us posted. You're going to be here on the live stream, hopefully. You know, come, report back in and let us know how the uh, the lawn does. All right, next up we have Soccer Fan. He says, what average temp do you think is good to do a heavy sand level on Bermuda? So as far as average temperature, I, I can't really give you one soccer fan. It's more so when the lawn has fully grown in. So if you're out there already, you're, you're fertilizing it, you're mowing it regularly, um, the lawn is fully greened up, that is when, you know, you're, you're in a good position to do a leveling job. Here in Northeast Georgia, what that normally equates to is late April to early May timeframe. And really that window will extend from May all the way through into really the first week of August for for leveling work. So it's not really a temperature, it's more of like how your particular lawn is doing. The next thing I would say, as far as a sand level, I would not go heavy. I'm not a fan of like, you know, of beaching the entire lawn where you can't see any of the grass. I would recommend that you apply sand between a quarter of an inch to half an inch, and, and that's gonna allow the, the lawn to recover faster. If you get any heavy rainfall, it's not gonna make quite as much of a mess. And overall, I find produces a better result. So just something to keep in mind as far as your um, your top dressing works. If I have an article, you know, on this in case you're interested in reading it, on the topic of top dressing, and it it says pretty much what I'm telling you, right? That you know when it comes to when it comes to leveling, a lot of people are trying to only have to go through the pain one time by saying I'm going to go super heavy and that's going to be it, and you know I'll get it all level all in one go, and it rarely works out that way. 
because what you're going to find is if you get get like a lot of heavy rainfall, um, the sand's going to move around because you don't think about it. Because you have the grass. Say this is my fingers are the grass again. Not a great example of grass. But say this is my fingers are the grass, and you've got say if you do it the way that I'm suggesting, where you go relatively light, so half an, a quarter inch to half an inch to where the sand is like here, and there's still some grass to kind of hold onto the sand and hold it in place. Now, if you get rainfall the chances of a lot of it like largely shifting and moving all over the place is a lot less. Now, take the same grass and put like a sand cap to where you've got, you know, a, an inch of sand over it. Yeah, from, from the outset when you're done, it looks really good. But if you get heavy rainfall, and especially if there's any kind of a slope, any kind of a grade, the sand's going to move around. It's going to make a big mess. And you're going to be out there with a leveling rake once it's done trying to put it all back together. So it's your call which way you want to go. I've done it both ways and I can tell you that especially if you have, unless your lawn is perfectly flat, I really wouldn't consider going super heavy. Um, the, the way the math works out is a yard, one cubic yard of material, of top dressing mix, sand, soil blend, or whatever you decide to go with, does a pretty good job of achieving that quarter to half an inch um, of material over the entire lawn, over, over a thousand square feet. So that's what I would encourage you to do. Uh, you know, the nice thing is if you do your first level in, um, let's say, May, early May, you still got plenty of time to do more. Like you can do, you know, two, three top dressings in a season if you want. And what you're going to find is every subsequent top dressing is really going to take a is going to take less and less material to get a um, to get a good result. So that's what I would encourage you to do. I don't know where you are in the country, but late April, early May is the time frame when the window really opens for top dressing work for me. And um, you can just use that as your guide. In case you're interested, there's a blog post that we have on how to top dress your lawn, a complete guide talks about um, like how heavy to go, talks about um, the tools you're gonna need, aeration, like doing a, a mild high to cut reset, fertilizers, like all, the, like all the things as far as getting a good result um, doing a top dressing job. And uh, if you're interested in that, I will link that in the chat for you now so you can read that at your convenience. So yeah, there you go. Hope that helps. And if you, uh, you know, if you need anything else, any other questions, don't hesitate to reach out it's a good question good question when can i go out and i can beach the lawn because that's that's what all the cool kids are doing and again you can absolutely do it but i can i can tell you here's the thing i, I don't know which live stream it was last year but there was a there was a viewer that did exactly what you're talking about he went heavy with the top dressing and he was doing like a seeding project and he had heavy rainfall and his thing his grade of his lawn was not really that steep it had a mild slope but not anything really to talk about and it made a colossal mess when he had you know had heavy rainfall so just something to consider i wouldn't go crazy heavy when it comes to um to top dressing a bermuda lawn you want you want the the tips of the grass blade to, to be exposed if you can because it's just going to recover faster you're, you're going to make less of a mess you're going to get a better job and it's just going to you can always do it again you can always use like spot top dressing in certain areas that didn't come out perfect uh, you know with with far less material as the season progresses so that's what i would try and encourage you to to do all right next up is Dermaculus thompson he says greetings ron i have a have a great live i catch the replay celebrating my born day <laughs> your birthday with the missus it's a good reason it's a good reason i appreciate you watching after the fact Happy birthday. Hopefully you guys are out doing something fun, you know, having a having a good dinner or whatever it is you guys like to do. And uh, yeah, keep me, uh, if, again, I appreciate you watching after the fact. All right, so next up we have, you're very welcome, sir, amazing. Next up we have James Smith. He says, I saw something interesting. Do tell, James, what did you see? He says, have you seen the California trimmer catalyst mowers? I've not seen them personally. I've seen pictures of them. This is their version of the cartridge solution. Also coming out with electric mower, the crossover. Crossover. Right? Uh, no, I've not seen any of them personally. It's going to be a great year for real mowers, man. I mean, you got, I think they're doing one. McLean's doing one. Uh, you know, the new real rollers, Revolution, that um, that I know they've already launched. And they're. I think they're going to be delivering them here in the next month or so. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, it's a good month for real mowers. I have not personally seen that one. And it's just going to, you know, an, a cartridge system mower is kind of nice in the sense that you have a lot of flexibility, but we'll see. You know, I guess when people get their hands on them and they make content and they report on how it works, you will uh, you'll know. I have not seen one myself to be able to um, put hands on it and say, this one, this is the way, this is the way to go, right? So time will tell. It always does. All right, LTX Shep. LTX Shep, like Shep Transmissions, is um, 
is in the house. He says, North Texas Bermuda grass, 4,000 square feet. I haven't done any spring soil test yet, but my fall test shows I'm a tad high on pH and barely optimal for nitrogen. Yeah, I wouldn't, if you're just, just, at, just at seven uh, LTX, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sweat it too much, man. I mean, you know, if you want to use a sulfate to bring it down a little bit, you can, but I mean, it's, that's, that's still within, that's still within the, um, the acceptable zone. I wouldn't go, uh, I wouldn't go too crazy. And you said, I'm also optimal for phosphorus at 7.25 and low on all micronutrients. I have a bunch of POA and usually get a lot of Dallas grass. In November, I put down some Scots Winter Guard. Okay, cool. Well, for the Dallas grass, what I would tell you is to just dig it out, like physically remove it. And um, the herbicides, like the herbicide that was really good for controlling Dallas grass, unfortunately, you, you're, you're not supposed to use it anymore on residential lawns. Um, and so your best bet is to physically remove it. It might take you know a couple of seasons to get it gone, but just digging it out as, as you see it come in is really gonna be the way to go. As far as Poannua goes, you know, Bermuda, you can use Certainty. Like Certainty will control Poannua that's growing actively in your lawn. But again, the, the best way to you know keep Poa out of your lawn is with pre-emergent. It's better to just not even have it in the first place versus having to use a post-emergent herbicide. And as far as the herbicide, the pre-emergent that I'd recommend, would be a spectacle flow. I would go with this. And the time to apply it, you didn't say where you are. Do you say where you are? You're in Texas, yeah. So the time to apply it would be like late August, early September. You can apply a single app. You can do multiple apps. It depends on which way you want to go. I've done both. I've tested doing like a single app at the higher rate. And I, this past year, I did a split application, one in the first part of September, and then again in December. And the results so far have been the same. We'll see as the season, you know, between, which again to like February, later February and March, how, see if I have any breakthrough. But last year, the single application at a higher rate worked great. This year so far, the split application, once in September and again in December, is working great. So I'll keep you guys posted as far as how, how, it, um, how it does. And as far as micronutrients, if you're trying to correct that, what I'd say is you can go with a granular fertilizer that has micronutrients in it. You can say which ones, um, said all of them are low. Um, but as far as a way to address all micronutrient deficiencies, what you can do is you go to shop and then lawn fertilizer. There is a micronutrient called Nutrizolve. And the thing about Nutrizolve is it has all the micronutrients. So your, your iron, your copper, your zinc, your boron, molybdenum, I'm not sure if I'm missing any, manganese, it has all of them. Like all the, all the, um, all of your micronutrients. So this is this would be your jam. This is what I would go with if you're looking to, to bring those micros up. And uh, yeah, so we covered your micronutrients. We covered your how to get rid of POA and how to get rid of Dallas grass. As far as a granular fertilizer that has some micronutrient in it, again, not the same, the complete suite like what Nutrizolve does. You could go with um, the Stress 12024. Um, and if your lawn requires... Um, um, phosphorus, then you can go with the complete 14714. Both of these guys contain um, some iron, zinc, and um, manganese, I believe. It contains one of the M's. I forget which one it is, but they, both of these contain um, some micronutrients as well. So I would I would take either of these and stack it with Nutrizolve. That is what I would do. So hope that is helpful, sir. Again, if you have any uh, questions, uh, let me know. And then, um, so LTX says, he says, don't laugh. He says, oh, oh, all this is before you got into the Golf Course Lawn Academy. Okay, cool. He says, I just put down Essential G and followed up with some Prodiamine and Certainty. Okay, how long should I wait until I put down Celsius? So here's the thing. So even though you see me talk a lot about Celsius and Certainty, they serve different roles. So you have a lawn that's got lots of broadleaf weeds in it and also got like sedges, um, in it at the same time. That's when mixing both these together and spraying them at the same time is the way to go. If all you have is Poannua, then all I would use is Certainty. Celsius is not gonna do a whole lot for you against um, against Poa, or or really even Sedges for that matter. And versus now, if all you have are Sedges in your, or, or Broadleafs in your lawn, I would not use Certainty, I would only use Celsius. So they they the two can be used together, but it's not strictly necessary to use them both together all the time, you know what I'm saying? So uh, for, again, I, I said it earlier and I've said it before in other, li in other live streams, if I can only have one herbicide, like for warm season grass, they say, hey Ron, you can only have one post-emergent herbicide, this is gonna be it, you can, I can sell it by pre-emergent, but you only have one post-emergent herbicide for warm season grass, um, it, it would probably be Celsius, I'd probably be this, because it, it controls so much 
and it does it without injuring your, your grass at, at higher temps in the process, which is why I'm such a big fan of it. Um, so just because you sprayed certainty does not necessarily mean you have to use Celsius. If you have broadleaves, Celsius. If you have sedges and poannua, certainty. If you got both, then both. All right, so hope that helps. Any other questions, let me know. Um, sounds like you're moving on onto the right track. Uh, so yeah, if you, great question, um, LTX Shep. And if you have any other questions, again, don't hesitate to uh, to reach out. All right, uh, next up is Oliver Rittum. Oliver is in the house. He says, happy Friday, Ron and gang. PGR for 2024, let's go. Question, doing another top dressing project this year, wait to use PGR after lawn recovery or okay to use before? I, I will tell you, if it's the first time you're top dressing your lawn, don't use growth regulator. It's gonna recover a lot faster. I will tell you that I start spraying my lawn with PGR in like mid-April, mid-April to the first part of May, um, and it stays under regulation until October timeframe. And I top dress the lawn throughout the season um, while it's under regulation, and it recovers just fine. Again, I don't go like like the person that was asking earlier um, about as far as my top dressing, I don't go crazy heavy to make it difficult for the lawn to bounce back, right? So as long as you're going light with your top dressing, um, the lawn will recover just fine um, even when it's under regulation. So if, if you guys have watched any of my videos on top dressing in the last four years, three or four years, like on in every single one of those videos, my lawn was, I had, I had growth regulator on the lawn. I had Primo, so. You guys can see how it recovered. It did. It did just fine. Again, for the if it's the very first time you're top dressing your lawn to where you might end up going a little bit heavier in some spots, and you just really want it to recover faster, then yeah, don't don't use growth regulator because it's going to help it recover faster. I mean, if you if you do that, it's still a recover. It's just going to take longer. And most people, with the, the first time they top dress their lawn, they're kind of impatient. They don't know what to expect. Like most people will do it and they think, oh man, I ruined my lawn. I covered it all in sand. Is it going to grow back? And the way to get past that sooner is to not slow down the process of recovery. But once you've been through a few cycles of top dressing, and um, if the lawn is under regulation, it's still it's still just fine. It'll it'll grow through it without without any issue. So again, in, if you've seen any top dressing videos of mine for the last few years, my lawn's been under regulation for all of them. Which does the lawn recover faster or does it recover slower rather if you're using Primo? Yes. Does it recover just fine though? Yes. So it's really up to you as far as how patient. Um, or impatient you are. I, I like the way the turf looks, how it grows when it's under regulation, which is why I just I start that in like mid-April and I just continue it all throughout the season. So hope that helps, Oliver. Uh, great question. So it really depends on when you plan on doing your top dressing, but, um, but now you know what I do and you can decide whether that is for you or not. Whichever way you go, the lawn is gonna be just fine. Just don't go crazy heavy as far as, um, you know, with how heavy you put the, the product down or put the material down. All right, next up is um, CPIMS. Colin is in the house. Colin's in the house. Actually, no, first we got Turf Brothers here. He says, what's up, Ron and Golf Course Lawn Squad? Travis Winston here from Turf Brothers. Happy Friday, everyone. What's going on, Travis? Hope you're doing well. Thanks for coming to hang out, sir. Appreciate you. And then uh, next up is Colin. CPIMS is in the house. He says, Ron, what's happening? Not too much. Not too much. I'm you know recovering from some stuff, but hey, life goes on. He says, tuning in for a great lawn talk as always. I gotta say, I'm over this rain we've been getting in California. Ha ha. Now here's the thing, Colin. I'm gonna, you know, I, I should screenshot this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna screenshot this comment because you know what's gonna happen? Whenever we get to like June and there's no rain, you're gonna be like, oh Lord, why has, you know, why, why we why has California been forsaken? Why can't we get rainfall? I'm gonna remind you, hey, remember, remember like February when you guys were getting all the rain, you're saying it's too much rain, and now you're not getting any. You know, it'll uh, it'll work out, man. It'll be it'll be just fine. I mean, you're not mowing yet anyway. The lawn is still still waking up, so yeah, don't don't sweat it. Take the rain while you got it. Free water is a good thing. All right, Dalvin Larry is in the house. He says anxiety is high. I'm out of the country. The weather is warming, and I will not be back till March. I'm actually hoping for another cold snap to, uh, myself to get yourself some time. Um, LOL. This is the worst time to be away. Now. Dalvin, we're here for you. I realize you're out of the country. It's warming up. You're worried about the lawn. You're not getting your pre-emergent down and, you know, things are not great, but it's going to be all right, man. It's going to be okay. I mean, worst case, don't you have a friend, you know, someone you like, friend, cousin, someone you can you, know, you can pay to go by and put down, uh, apply the pre-emergent for you? You, know, you may have to just get a granular and say, be very careful. Like say, hey, listen, get my spreader out, set it to this, put this in there, and then apply my pre-emergent. Or are you one of these people where you're like, I'm the only one 
on planet Earth that can apply pre-immersion the right way on my lawn. If I'm not doing it, no one can do it. So I just have to wait till I get back. Are you that kind of person? I kind of feel like you are. But I'm just saying, if you're gonna be gone for a while and you're worried about it, you know, you might, it's not a bad idea to get someone to apply pre-immersion for you. In other words, if it were me, right? If it were me, and I were gonna be out of Georgia until, you didn't say when in March, say like late March, I would get someone to apply pre-immersion to my lawn. Because it's that big a deal. Because otherwise, you're gonna be, you know, fighting with weeds throughout the spring and summer, and that's just a whole lot of not fun. So I'd have to like swallow my pride, get someone else to come out, spray the lawn, and that's just, it's it's worth it. Versus fighting weeds, you know, throughout the spring and summer. So something to keep about, just, 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 just a thought. Something to consider. All right, so we have another super chat here. Let me get down and grab this really quick. This one is from Mr. Gene MKL. He says, Super chat, Garcia. My soil test is in the mail. How dry does the soil need to be when getting a sample? West Tennessee. Uh, I mean, not, not super dry, Gino. I mean, I don't, I mean, if you just had, you know, two, three inches of rain, I wouldn't run out right after that and collect your sample then. But once the lawn has had the opportunity to dry out, you can, you can pull cores and it'll be just fine. You know what I mean? So again, right after ra heavy rainfall, I wouldn't collect cores then, but I mean, once it's dried out to where you, if you know, if you would walk on the lawn without worrying about it, like becoming muddy or, or doing damage to it by you just walking on it, you're going to be good to go out there and collect cores for your soil test. So hope that helps her. Great question. And uh, good job, man. I, li I like it. I like where your mind is as far as getting your soil test done. Good, good stuff. And again, thank you for the super chat. I really do appreciate it. Appreciate all the love and support. Appreciate it, appreciate it, appreciate it. All right, back to where we left off. The hard part after I go and get a super chat. Oh. Next up is Boom Bye Bye is in the house. He says, um, hey, Ron, I'm from South Florida. I have mole crickets in Mazoysia lawn and SPF bluegrass. What do I do to get rid of them? Um, so mole crickets, I want to say Delta Guard will do that. Boom, boom, bye-bye. I get that. I get this question like a couple times a year. So every time I have to go and just double check to make sure I'm telling you, telling you right, I'm pretty sure Delta Guard will do it. Um, pretty sure that's what you can use. Or is, it, or is that for mites? Maybe I'm wrong. We were confusing mites and um, and something else. Let's see. Dun, 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 yeah, that's that's for um, that is for that is for um, for mites. But I think I think it has control against mole crickets too. You know, I might unless I'm crazy. I thought it did both of them. Let us see here. Let me uh, let me consult the product label, and I will I'll tell you. Um, but, but you know what? This is, this is not cooperating. So let me just download it and I will, I will look here and I will, um, I'll verify it myself for you. All right. Uh, mole crickets and Delta guard. All right. Okay. Bear, why do you guys turn the label sideways? This makes, this makes, uh, yeah, so it does control that. It does have control for that. So I'm looking here at it. Um, I'm looking at the label. Um, and yeah, mole crickets are, are are listed on here. And it actually has special guidance. has special guidance for them. So two to three pounds per thousand square feet. So special guidance for mole crickets. Um, and that is, um, it is labeled to control that. So here is the product I'm talking about. And um, this is where you can pick um, it up. Boom, bye, bye. Sorry you're dealing with that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, this is what I would, um, this is what I would go with. And I think I spell guard wrong in my link, but you will have to forgive me. Uh, yes. Yep. Here it is. So this is the product I'm talking about in a granular, and that should do the trick for you as far as, um, mole cricket and, um, Bermuda. It does both Bermuda mites, um, and, and mole crickets. It does both of them. There might be other herbicides, um, herbicides, other insecticides for mole crickets as well, but that's one that, um, that I know will work. So hope that helps, sir. You're all covered. And again, sorry you're dealing with that. All right. Uh, um, uh, Turb Brother says, did you get the gift? Um, good for the limited. Yeah, I have to go. I have to go to the post office and go check the mailbox, but it should be there. I think I saw something that was there. So I got, I'll probably run tomorrow and grab it and be able to tell you. But I appreciate you sending, sending it to me. I'll keep you posted. Randall Lard is in the house. He says, evening, Ron. Got uh, the lawn cut to half an inch. Look at you. Overachiever. 
Soil sample sent off and pre-emerged down. Mother Nature watering it in now. Let's wait for spring. Have a great show. Yeah, man, you did it all. So you got you cut it down to about half an inch, which is nice if you're trying to maintain it at three quarters of an inch. You get your pre-emerged down. I like that too. You got it watered in. You're doing all the things, man. Now it's just patience. Patience and you know, you'll be on your way. You'd be rewarded with a weed-free lawn this spring and summertime, right? Next up is Steven Johnson. He says, happy Friday, Ron. Have you heard anything about some more revolution updates slash content coming soon? Also, have you heard seen the K9 corrector for dogs pee spots? I have not. Thoughts? Uh, Turf Titans, I believe, is a company. Yeah, I've not heard of that. I've not heard of the product for uh, dog urine. I don't, I don't know. And as far as the revolution, uh, the last I heard is that people that order that pre-order them are getting them next month. We're in February now, so in in March is when I believe they're going to be getting they're going to be they're going to start shipping them out, um, and you'll be on your way, right? So that's that's what I have heard. Like you know what I know, you know what I know. I think I, next month is what I is what the last thing that I heard as far as whenever deliveries are going to happen. I think you guys are going to really like the mower. I think you guys are gonna really like it. It's uh, it's got a lot, a lot of work has gone into it, and you know, it's funny. My true cut is, um, is I need a clutch for it, and I can't bloody get one because just you can't get part parts for true cuts these days. And I really need a mower to be able to cut like specific parts of my lawn, like the swale area and some other areas. So if I can't get one, if I can't get parts in there to to fix my true cut, then I don't know. I may have to. I may have to get another something else. We have to go with the revolution, and then you know, part with the true cut or something. I don't know because I got. I have to have a mower to mow between like Alex and myself. I can't have it looking all, all like you know, janky looking. Can't can't have that. Got a rep up hole, right? All right. Brian Hall is up next. He says, "Hey Ron and everybody in the chat, spring teaser here in Michigan. We had 60 degree weather today. Congratulations. That's nice for Michigan. That's really good, man. That's that's encouraging. Hopefully it it, uh, it that that sticks around for you guys. Probably not, but." You know, you can enjoy the 60-degree weather while you have it. Next up is Mark Luna's in the house. He says, good evening. Some green is starting to show up to the party. Hello, 2024. Hit that like button. I appreciate that, um, Mark. Yeah, guys, so we have 93 likes, 115 people in the live stream right now. We can do better than that. If you've not hit the like button as yet, please do so. It's a free way to support the channel, support the content. Sends good vibes to YouTube and uh, helps grow uh, helps grow the show, right? Which is always, always fun. All right, next up is James Smith. He says, as everyone preps their tools for the spring startup, think Lee over at Real Rollers will add a 240 grit to go with the 80 and 120 backlot pace. Time to get our tools sharpened up. Yeah, guys, that's a, that's a good point. You know, this time of year, if you, you know, while you're waiting for the lawn to grin, grin growing into where you can get out there and start, you know, having fun mowing it and this kind of stuff, like take this time to get all your gear like sharpened up. If you've not, if you got, you know, mowers, get them sharpened. If you got, you know, string trimmers or anything like that that are gas powered, do your maintenance, change the spark plug, put a fresh air filter on it. You know, just do all the things to, to put yourself in a good spot to where once um, once the grass is really going, you are good to go. You're not going to be like everybody else, you know, struggling to get a spot in the workshop to get your equipment taken care of. So that's a good advice, uh, James. Two, 240 grit. Man, that, that's going to make back. I mean, I guess you're going to, you can really refine the edge you get, but that's going to, that's gonna take a while to, to backlap using that. I guess you would do what you'd go to 80, then 120, and then kind of step, you know, step it to the to the 240. That's gonna be, you know, it's gonna be interesting. If you get the 240, uh, James, you know, we'll probably get it. Robert will probably get the 240, knowing him. It'll be interesting to see, like, if you can, if there's um, a noticeable difference in sharpness, or in other words, if the juice is worth the squeeze from a standpoint of the additional time it takes to backlap at 240 grit versus you know something a bit more coarse like 80 or 120. So keep me posted. Uh, Brandon Kennedy is up next. He says, Prodiamine is down at high rate. I will power rake and aerate this year along with my annual sand leveling and pendimethylin app in May. So I guess you're doing another, you do another pre-emergent. Okay. I'm curious to know what your sequence would be if you do a pendimethylin app. I don't, I don't. I do Prodiamine in like now and then I, that's it for me as far as pre-emergent until the fall. So if you if you want to do a split application, um, then you could do prodiamine instead of doing it at the high rate. It's kind of too late for you now, but if you could take like the annual allocation of prodiamine that's correct for your particular grass type, cut that in half. You do an application now, and then a few months down the road, you do another application, and that you know will they say will help extend the coverage. Um, in your case, so you really shouldn't have to do another pre-emergent. Like you did prodiamine at the high rate, that should be good. You really shouldn't need to do any more pre-emergent on your lawn, you know? So in for the springtime anyway. So it's, it's your call, 
Um, but you know, when it comes to pre-emergent, like more isn't always better. It's like everything else in life, like all things at in moderation at the correct rates. I wouldn't, you know, do another pre-emergent just just because, especially since you did you know prodiamine at the higher rate, Brandon. So something something to consider, something to keep in mind. Sorry, I don't have a better answer for you on that, but again, I don't I don't do I don't do split applications um, of my pre-emergent. Not because I'm opposed to it. It's just that I've just not seen the need for it on my lawn or Alex's lawn or the neighbor's lawn or the other person that I help with their lawn. Like on all, all those lawns, they get a single application of pre of um of pre-emergent at the higher end of the uh, the of the rate. And that works, that works great for me. That works great for Bermuda grass. Now, you may not be able to do that on some cool season grasses. You may have some, some issues if you decide to go that route. But for Bermuda grass, I've, I've gotten great results doing it. And that just saves you from not having to deal with pre-emergent in like April time frame, right? I can just be out there mowing and fertilizing and spraying the lawn and just having a grand old time and not having to worry about, um, well, you know, trying to prevent weeds with pre-emergent. So I uh, hope that helps, sir. Great question. If you have any other, any other uh, comments or whatnot, let me know. And uh, as far as your, yeah, you didn't ask about the, the top dressing, but, um, but yeah, I would not, in other words, I would not do more. I wouldn't in the springtime. All right, next up is Granger is in the house. He says, um, hey, my friend, got my Miramichi green shirt ordered. Thanks again. You are very welcome, sir. He says, I will send a picture of my excitement when it comes. LOL, I'll definitely do that. Granger, here's the thing. Make sure you take a nice side profile shot. You know what I mean? It, it, what you can do is this. take a side profile shot and don't look at the camera. Kind of look out in the distance. Kind of like a, you know, one of those, one of those like, I'm about to take over the world. Like just kind of you know, chin slightly up like that. I think that would be the look for you with the, with the shirt. You don't want to just look right at the camera. You want to kind of, you know, give it more of an epic epic type look is what I would say. All right, uh, next up is Jacob Madrid. He says, what's up, Ron, the Strike Action Gang? I am seeing some green up already here in Arizona. Hope you had a nice week. Yeah, the, I mean, Arizona is hot as, as, um, as hot as it gets there. I'm not surprised that you guys are getting uh, some green, you know, getting some green in your lawn already. Uh, this week is definitely doing better now. Started out not that great earlier in the week, but it's, uh, you know, things are going well. And looking forward, like you, to the lawn doing well this season. All right, um, next up, see, why do why do folks come in here and do, it's always, there's always some people just have no behavior. Why is that? You know, people come in here, our fragrance journey saying, I'm not going to say it, you guys can read it for yourself. You know, it's, it, here's the thing, if you want us to back that team in the state that's near Georgia, that's fine. You can do that. But you got to come in and just be, you know, like basically swearing in the live stream. It's not, not, it's not necessary, man. And here's the thing. You guys better watch out. You know, you all don't have saving anymore. So next year, you better, you, you know, y'all you know, might get some humble pie. Y'all may have to, we're about to find out. We're about to find out. Was it was it the team or was it was it the guy? Was it the saving or was it the team? So we shall, uh, we shall see. It's going to be a fun, be a fun season, fun season next year. I appreciate it, uh, Ted. It says 110 viewers, only 50 likes. Hit that like button. Definitely, guys, hit that like button. It's a, it's a free way to support the channel. All right, uh, next up, what do we have here? It says, um, we have a question from David. He says, I bought a bottle of Negate in March last year and mixed it in a gallon of water for mixing into my backpack sprayer. Do you think it's still effective for use this year? No, no. Really, you don't want to be storing that for more than more than four weeks, four to six weeks. I mean, the the you, I think you're talking about the intermediate mix, right? Where you take, because when you mix in the gate, you're supposed to take the entire contents, mix it at once into like an intermediate mix, and then you can you can dole that out into your backpack sprayer for spraying, which is a big part of why I don't, I don't really recommend that herbicide for most people, because if you're mixing it per the label, you're supposed to use it pretty much use it all up in a, in, in a go, right? You're not supposed to store it for, for extended periods of time. Um, so especially from like, if it's from last year, no. So what I would say is find like a waste disposable facility in your area that will handle chemicals and then dispose of it that way. I, I, I mean, you could try if you want, but I, I, I would not, I would not, I would just dispose of it. And then I would go, if you're using the gate, I'm imagining you're trying to control Poanua. Um, what I would do is certainty. Like this is, um, it's a little bit more expensive than the gate. Um, but it's a great product and it's got measurements to where you can mix just what you're going to need so you don't end up having to waste a bunch of product. So that would be uh, my advice. Um, and then Robert Rainey says, of course, Robert says, Lee has requested that for 240 grit. We asked for it last time he was in the channel. So there you go. <laughs> I had, how do I know that you were the reason behind the 240 grit? He's like, he's probably sister, you know, it was, it's sharp. But if I had some 240, 
I could split hairs with this real mower. I, I could see that, Robert. And, and I tell you what, if anyone is going to test it, it's going to be you. And definitely report in as far as how it does when you get the 240 grit on your um, on your John Deere. Good stuff. Okay, uh, next up is No Name. He says, Ron, hey, Ron, and fellow lawn enthusiast, pre-emergent down at my house and my parents. Look at, man, look at you. You're a good son. You took care of your lawn. You're also saying, you know what? I can't have, I can't do mom and dad dirty. I got to make sure that their lawn is also looking good too. So you went over there and you sprayed their lawn as well. You know, we're going to clap it up for that. That's nice. That's nice. Take care of your lawn and mom and dad's lawn. So Spectacle Flow did a great job from the fall until now. Let's get those likes up. Yeah, it's a great product. Again, it's not cheap. I wish it were less expensive, but I mean, they charge what they charge for because they know it's good, right? They're like, hey, you know, we, you know, if you want to keep Poe out of your warm season grass, this is the stuff to use. Pay us. And but, I mean, they didn't say it exactly like that, but they kind of say it like that. That's kind of how it is. All right. All right. Jimmy Miller is up next. He says, I wonder how much of the POA that is starting to pop up here and there in my yard is from a major problem I had with weed infestation last year. Oh. I've been applying pre and post emergence since then. Hard to say, Jimmy. It's hard to say. Uh, you know, when it comes to pre to, to controlling POA in, um, especially in a warm season lawn, like what I found, some people will try and just use prodiamine um, just in the fall. And while I, 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 I kind of bag on prodiamine a little bit for this purpose, but I really, but I, I got to qualify that. It's like using prodiamine as your fall pre-emergent is still like worlds better than not doing anything. Worlds better. But as far as producing the, the kind of control that most people expect if you use it by itself for keeping poanua out of your lawn, it's not that great. Like it needs a little bit of help. So if you can use, if you can stack prodiamine with like, uh, with like Princep, with Simazine, like that tends to work a bit better. And if you already got some breakthrough of poanua in your lawn, you can mix, you can add some image in the tank. So you can do like image, um, uh, prodiamine and Simazine, like that combination does a pretty good job. But again, in my opinion, if you just want to save time and get a result that's even better, just go buy Spectacle because it's, it's, it's as far as what you're trying to, you're trying to deal with, like it's going to be the best way to go. And again, you can buy a bottle and just split it with someone, find someone like a neighbor or friend in your neighborhood. That's also into taking care of their own lawns and you guys can split it up. And then that's going to, that's a way to, you know, to kind of offset the cost a bit of it. But it's as far as what you're trying to do, keeping POA out of, um, out of a warm season lawn. Like again, I've, I've, I've tried dithiapyr in the fall. I've done prodiamine by itself in the fall. I've done Prodiamine, Simazine, and Amazequin in the fall. And I've also done a Spectacle Flow. So I've done, I mean, not every combination, but I've done a lot of the common combinations. And by far, by far, Spectacle is the best. By far. The 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 the, the trifecta, Prodiamine, Simazine, and Image are are pretty good. Um, but it's still not as good as Spectacle. So hope that helps. All right, Ted is up next. He says it washed out. Okay, it never got those spots established. Hmm. So you had it. So you, it didn't grow in because it gets just kind of sloped or something, and you just every time it rained, it wa the seeds washed away. Hmm. I don't know, man. I mean, give it a shot and see. Um, you know, fescue d is not really that hard to grow in to get it to germinate and grow in nicely. So I mean, we'll give it another shot this spring and see what um see what happens. You know. All right. Uh, next up is Gavin Moore. Gavin Moore is in the house. Um, he says, Hey Ron, you are the professor in lawn care. I try, man. I try. I mean, I know a little bit, I know a little bit about a few things and I, and I try and share that with, with, uh, with folks that want to listen. His question, I bought a new home last September and finally got my honeydews caught up. And now I purchased barricade 4L for pre-emergent. Is this good? Sure. It's a great product. So pr the active ingredient in barricade is prodiamine, which we're going to be talking about um, a bunch tonight. And yeah, it's a great product. Just read the label apply the product per the, uh, the recommended rates um, on the label and you're going to get a good result. You know, water it after you're done and away you go. Yeah. Good job. Good job getting your honeydews uh, done and also getting your pre-emergent or looking at getting your pre-emergent applied because that will also make wifey happy, uh, happy too, right? You know, you have the, um, you know, the honeydews are done and the lawn is weed free. So when she rolls up, friends and company come over like, oh, wow. You know, Miss Moore, your your lawn looks so nice. It's very you know, they like that kind of stuff. So you're doing you're covering it on all fronts. You're solving problems, sir, that she doesn't even realize she has yet. So good job on getting the uh, the barricade 4L. And yes, it'll be just fine. And you said I'm in Richmond. I'm in Richmond, Virginia. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, you're good. You're good. Yep, you're no 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 issues with that whatsoever. Okay. Um, next up is Tom Hoffenkamp. 
He says, um, and he asks for pictures. Um, <laughs> Tom's like, the lawn's on fire. I want to see pictures of it. He says, Noic Five got got uh, pictures of the of the lawn burning. Yeah, if you want to send a picture of it, I will try and get it up here in uh, in the live stream. I don't see any pictures of anybody as yet, but um, but uh, yeah, yeah. You want to send a picture, Noic? If you're assuming you're still here and you want to show folks, assuming you took pictures of your lawn on fire, which you absolutely should. That's a pretty epic picture, right? And you want to share it? Feel free to send it uh, send it my way. Ron at golfcourselawn.com. All right, Tutrilla in Manila is up next. He says, happy Friday, Ron and Sharp Action Gang. I mixed prodiamine at, uh, I guess, I'm trying, I'm guessing you're saying 0.83. I think you're saying 0.83. Uh, I mix 0.83 ounces of prodiamine into two gallons of water to spray 2,000 square feet. Did I spray the annual rate today or am I on track for the splitting application? Sir, you are on track for the split app. So the way the math works out is the rate for the rate range for prodiamine for Bermuda grass is 0.36 ounces per thousand square feet up to 0.83 ounces per thousand square feet. So in your case, you took you know the annual limit. So you took 0.8, you took, we'll call it 0.8 for the for, for math's sake. You took 0.8 and you put that into two gallons of water. And here's the important part. You took the two gallons of water with the 0.8 of um of 0.83 of prodiamine, and you sprayed it over 2,000 square feet. So by doing that, you essentially put down 0.4 ounces of prodiamine per thousand square feet. Does that make sense? Now, had you taken that two gallons of water and sprayed it over a thousand square feet, which you could have done, then yes, you would have gotten to the annual limit and you'd be done as far as applying prodiamine to your lawn for um, for the rest of the year. But in your case, you're good to go. You know. To point, you know, point 0.8, we'll call it point 0.8 in two gallons of water over 2,000 square feet. That leaves you another point 0.8 to use over uh, 2,000 square feet, uh, that same 2,000 square feet of lawn going forward. So yeah, you did you did it exactly right if your goal was to do a split application. Good stuff, great question. I like it, I like it. And I will break that down a little bit in the video that I'm putting together on pre-emergent. Um, it's already filmed and I talk about what you're talking, exactly your question uh, to Trilla. So if you guys are interested in that, um, then you can watch the video whenever it comes out. Whenever it go comes out. All right, next up is BB Nim. He says, um, what's up, Ron? Your thoughts on ortho orthene fire ant killer. Um, it's not bad for mounds. I've um, I've got a, a couple of videos on on um, and in fire and insecticides, um, I've I've tested it and it it works okay. Um, the the insecticide that I like the best for controlling fire ants is a product called Advion Advion Fire Ant Bait. So this guy right here, I discovered this stuff in 2018 and I have not looked back. So pretty much every year, um, springtime, Aprilish time frame, I'll go out and I'll I'll do an I'll do an application around the perimeter. And then I'll do my entire lawn. And then for the most part, does a great job of just keeping ants away. I don't really have a lot of issues with fire ants, not in the lawn anymore. Uh, so this is the stuff that I like to use. If you have a small mound here and there, you can use the um, the orthene as well. I've got a, actually got a video, I think, comparing them, comparing that actual product. Let me see if I can find it for you, BB Nim. The long and short of it, there's nothing wrong with it. If that's what you got, roll with it. Um, I like, um, I like, I prefer Advion um, is that's the, my that's my preference. All right, let's see here. Yep, I still got it. Here's the video. I found it, and it taught it actually compares those very two products. It compares the Orthene product and it compares Advion. So I will send a link to that for you here in the chat, so you can watch at your heart's content and decide for yourself whether Orthene is the way to go or whether Advion is the way to go. Um, let's see here, fire ant insecticide. Video. All right. Um, the, and the last time I checked, this stuff is like forty-five, less than forty-five, between forty and forty-five dollars on, on on Amazonia, and it lasts. It'll last you a long time. Like I mean, like I I typically go through a jug every two years. So one of these lasts me, and I have like twelve thousand square feet. You know, two years. So you, you're not gonna you're not gonna go through this stuff um, um, very quickly. And if you want, I'll give you a link to where you can find it. And I'll also link the video that I did a couple years ago on just Advion showing you how I like to use the product for a uh, for a good result. So I hope this um, this is useful. Let me check, yeah, the price right now on, on Amazon is like 43 bucks, so it's not bad. 
and then uh, add Vion fire and bait. Um, yeah, I'm, I also promised you the video. So let me get find that as well for you. You're getting all loaded up, man. You're gonna have so many options when it comes to figuring out fire ants in your lawn. You're gonna be like, man, I am, um, I did not, let me see here, ants. What did I call this video? Yeah, tired of ants in your lawn. Here we go. Um, boom. All right. Um, and there's the second video that's just specifically on, uh, on Advion. So hope that helps, BBNIM. And uh, if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to reach out. All right. Uh, next up is Jimmy Miller. He says, stump and root removal is set for two to three weeks down the road. Yeah, that, that's the thing that I saw, Jimmy. Get, get the, the stump out, the roots out, and then you're setting yourself up now to, you know, if there's any kind of leveling work that needs to happen, that's going to be good. And then you're, you're, you're creating an environment that's a lot more conducive to the grass growing in and, and looking well. Plus also to think about it, even if the Bermuda grass does could grow in there a little bit around the stump and around the roots, mowing it is going to be an absolute nightmare. So for that reason alone, you also want to get rid of the, the roots that are, especially the ones that are at the surface and that, that stump. Uh, next up is DGS1. Um, DGS1 he says, uh, hey, Ron and fellow on these uh, fanatics, how can I get my sulfur levels down? For the past two years, my sulfur levels have been holding steady at 28 using the MySol test kit. Thanks. Yeah, so as far as, um, that's a good question, DGS. I, I don't know of a way to, like, to, to lower sulfur levels by themselves. Having said that, I've not really seen, I've seen, look, I look at a lot of soil tests and I look at a lot of lawns. And I've, I've yet to come across a lawn where the lawn having high sulfur was the thing that was really ho holding the lawn from the grass back from looking great. Really what you tend to find is the, the nutrients on the, the ends of the pendulum. So you got like your, your NPK, so nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and then your micros. Like if those are looking good, um, that and you're, you know, you're mowing regularly, the, you tend to end up with a pretty good stand of grass. So like your, your calcium levels, sulfur levels, um, sodium, those are difficult to, to, to change and you certainly can't change them without affecting everything else. So my thing would be to not really, not really worry about it. You know, if I, when I look at soil tests out of like central Texas, pretty much all of them have high calcium levels. They're always, they're always like almost off the scale high and yet they're awesome lawns in Texas, all throughout Texas, they look, they look great. So I guess I'm saying that while you are seeing that, um, I would focus on, on the, um, on making sure your NPK, like the macros are where they need to be. And also where your micros need to be, because you're going to find like the, your sulfur and calcium. Yes. While they're high, not great. There's not really a whole lot that you can easily do uh, about just them without affecting, affecting other things. So hope that helps, sir. Good job on getting a soil test done. And hopefully this takes, you know, lower some of your stress levels about wondering, you know, how can I fix this one little parameter, which again, not, not an easy, um, not an easy one, but the good news is it's really not going to, it's not going to negatively impact, you know, how good your lawn can end up looking. So good stuff. Hope that helps. Uh, Tom is asking for pictures of the lawn on fire. I, I guess he didn't, he didn't send me any. I don't have anything from him. Keep asking him. All right. Next up is sure guy. He says, uh, cool skis of lawn here for spring green up. Should I fertilize the lawn then later apply PGR or should I use PGR then fertilizer? I would do the first way, uh, sure guy. I would begin feeding the lawn, begin mowing it regularly so to where it's, it's growing in and looking good, and then I would introduce growth regulator. The way I would do it is, which you'll find for for, um, for Primo, there will be a rate that is that assumes you're going to be applying the product once per month. Um, what I would say is take that rate and divide it in half and spray it on the 1st and the 15th. That's going to introduce the growth regulator a little bit more slowly to the plant. Um, and you're going to like the results you get with it. Like you're not going to get out of, the lawn's not going to come out of regulation and it's going to, you're going to like, like how it looks. So fertilize first, ensure the lawn is greened up, doing well, then introduce uh, Primo, introduce growth regulator. Great question. Good, good stuff. And if you are interested about, and in, in like, um, like the rates and, and um, just the, the idea of what I'm talking about as far as using split applications for applying uh, Primo. I've got a blog post on the topic on plant regulation because it is that awesome. Like I tell you, when it comes to Primo Max, the, it's it's really, there's life before Primo and there's life after Primo. Like I have yet, and I'm sure it's going to happen one day. It might happen this year. This year might be the year, but I have yet to find anybody that started using growth regulator. Again, started using it the right way, followed the, followed the, apps, the correct rates and applied it. Um, and didn't absolutely love the results they got with it. So yeah, so this um, blog post um, on the topic of how plant growth regulation can make your lawn thicker and greener, why it is 
an awesome tool for creating a golf course quality stand to turf is all about that topic. It talks about the benefits of pre-GR, has some videos embedded, um, talks about Primo Max, um, covers like um, what I was telling you about as far as taking the monthly rate and spraying that at half rate like twice per month. And um, because I got enough questions about it, I got tired of answering the same email over and over and over and over again. Um, I, uh, I put together the um, a split application rate table here for common grass types. So what I'll do is I will send this to you, sure guy, in case you're interested. It's some quick reading. Um, it sounds like you're already convinced on the merits of PGR, but in case you were looking for some like some more info, uh, you can take a look at this and hopefully you find it uh, find it useful. All right, uh, sure guy. All right, so next up we have, who do we have? We have It's Me, check Instagram here really quick. Uh, nope, nothing else. Uh, next up we have is It's Me. He says, how do you mow the lawn right up on a fence or house, a trimmer? That's a great question, It's Me. Um, so on most mowers, on not most mowers, on, on all real mowers, um, you're going to have the zero edge. You're going to have the, the side that allows you to get closer to barriers like fence, pavers, that kind of thing. Um, you can make your pass with in that direction with the mower to get as close to the edge as you can. And then if you're looking for a quality of cut that, that is the same as what you get with your real mower, you're going to want to invest in a set of rotary scissors. You can use a string trimmer, it's gonna do a pretty good job, but it doesn't approach the quality of cut that you get with uh, with rotary scissors. So that's what I would say to, you would do if you're looking to get, you know, get get that, that nice manicure look right up against a fence, right up against a house, right up against pavers or anything, any kind of hardscapes you have on your property. I've got a video on that topic, on, uh, on rotary scissors. I, I'm, okay, here we go, I found it, there we go, boom, here we go. Um, and it talks about that. It'll show you actually using it, the results you get with it, and all the all the benefits of these um, of this tool. Here's the thing: they're not cheap, um, but they're totally worth it. If you want an awesome looking lawn, it's um, they are tough tough to beat. It's one you know what it is. It's one of those tools that is like once you've got you know once you've got like pretty much everything. You got your string trimmer. You got your back. You got your backpack spray. You got your blower. You have you you know you're the guy or gal that pretty much has everything for your lawn. Like you're that person, and you're saying you know how can I get this one little area to look its absolute best? That is where rotary scissors shine. So it's not like something that I would go out and buy as your very first tool for in your lawn care arsenal, but as far as like it's almost like a torque wrench or. Um, like a stud puller, like you know, you have like a, spe like a specific tool that doesn't do a lot of things, but the thing that it's designed to do, it does better than anything else. That's what rotary scissors are. So you you don't necessarily need to use them everywhere, but for what you would use it for, like what you're describing, it they're they're pretty much unmatched in my opinion. Um, so this is the video on rotary scissors. You can see, um, I've got this steel or steel, however you pronounce it. Uh, rotary scissors on in my um, in my arsenal, but there are other companies that make make them as well too, and you can see the the benefits uh, there. So take a look at that. Hopefully, you get some value out of it. Um, that is what I would suggest if you're looking for that manicured look right up to, you know, flower beds and any kind of hardscape. Because you, you, to your point, you can only get the mower so close. All right. Next up is William L. William L. is in the house. He says. Um, Good stuff. He says, hey, Ron, I got my pre-emergent down this week using my brand new Yard Mastery Sprayer. You know what? You didn't ask this, but we're going to clap it up for that because new equipment, which worked beautifully. Can you talk about how we might use the different spray tips that came with it, please? Absolutely. Yeah. So the, the sprayer comes with an assortment of spray tips. There's really two that you need to be concerned about. There is the red spray tip and there is a white spray tip. And I don't have... You know what? I can actually pull up the spray tips here. Let me find it. Let me find it. And then that will make our lives easier because while talking is good, pictures are better, right? That way you guys can see what I am talking about. Okay. So um, what you look, what you're going to see here is um, it's going to come with a, se a set of tips, which for the most part, you can ignore most of these. The two tips you're going to be using most of, most of are the white uh, spray tip, which is the flood jet tip, which is what you use for uh, applying soil-based products. So like 
your insecticides, fungicides, pre-emergent, that's what this is for. And then you have the tip that's gonna live on your sprayer most of the time, which is the foliar tip. So between these two, this guy is gonna produce a very a larger droplet size. It's almost gonna look like a shower head, like, a, like bigger droplets. And this is gonna produce finer droplets that are, that are akin more to a mist. Like so, um, so the so this again you would use for pre-emergent insecticides, fungicides, um, those types of products. Anything that's going to go in the soil. The the red tip you would use for your um, liquid fertilizers, growth regulator, herbicides. So like uh, products like Celsius Certainty, uh, Tenacity, Sedgehammer, like any um, you know any any three way any any follow your base product you're going to want to use the red spray tip for. Now some of you guys don't have the Yard Mastery Spray and you're saying you know what those tips sound really cool. I'd like to have one. So just to save myself some time. Here is a link to the flood jet tip, the white tip that I was telling you guys about that it showed. And this is a link to the foliar spray tip, which you can see there. And if you're interested in seeing, you're like, you know, what how, you're saying to yourself, how big of a deal is it? Like how, what kind of difference does like changing the spray tip make as far as like how it covers the plant? Years ago, I got this question and I got tired of getting asked the same thing over and over. So I did a video on this topic. If I can find it, um, if I can find it, that, that covers exactly that. Um, let's see here. Yes, yes, I think this is the one. I think this is the one. I think this is the one that has where I, I walk through and I show um, up close um, which, yeah, here we go. Yep. This is the video. So, um, this is the one for you to watch that it show it talks about the different spray tips, but then also I show an example where I spray side by side two plants, one with like a large drop of spray tip and one with a foliar spray tip. And you can see the difference in coverage. Like, like me talking about it is one way, but actually seeing it, you see how much of a difference using the proper spray tip makes as far as how the, um, the product covers the, uh, the plant. So I will hook you up with that right here. Uh, let's see here, um, William. So at William L spray tip comparison video. So watch this and that will cover, that'll answer all your questions, everything you want about spray tips and then some, all right? So you'll be good to go as far as, as far as knowing, um, you know, being able to see for yourself the difference that it can make. But that's the nice thing about that particular sprayer, the Yard Mastery Sprayer, so while we carry it in the golf course lawn store, is that it comes with everything. Like you get the sprayer, which is a good one. It, in my opinion, it and the, um, you know, other competing sprayers in the same price range are, are very comparable. The nice thing with this is that it comes with everything you need. You get the flood jet tip, you get a follow your tip, and really, other than charge the battery up and go out and have fun, you don't, there's not a whole lot that you need to do. You know, there's some sprayers that have like a bunch of different, like different settings, really, um, with that sprayer, you're going to set it on the low pressure setting. And for the most part, it's going to live there. You know, you don't, you, it's rare that you actually have to use the high pressure setting on, um, on the sprayer. So, all right, good stuff. So now I can find out where I left off. This is the challenging part. So, all right, next up is I found William. All right. All right. So next up we have Chase Mathis. Chase Mathis, he says, I cut down a tree in my backyard in hopes of getting more sunlight. That's one way to do it. He says, will six hours of direct sunlight be enough for my Bermuda? Mm, probably not. Probably not. I mean, it's going to be better than what you were having before, but um, six hours isn't, I'll be honest with you, isn't a whole, are you talking about that's that's it? So six hours of sunlight and then it gets shaded by the house or some trees. I mean, you might, you could, you could try zoysia and see how zoysia does in that, but... Bermuda is going to really want more than that to really look good, in my opinion, uh, Chase. You can try it. You can try it. I mean, if it's already there, if you already have Bermuda in your back lawn, this, you know, time is going to tell. You know, you got rid of the tree. You know, once we get into April, May time frame, the days are longer, we're getting more heat. If you getting rid of that tree is getting enough sunlight to the lawn, it's going to respond and you're going to see the difference. I I don't know that six, six hours of sunlight is really going to be enough to really have it look the way you want, but we'll find out, you know, you know, we'll find out. I would, I would want, I would want more than that. Zoysia would, would probably be okay. I mean, maybe with six hours, but Bermuda, I think it's really going to take more than that. But again, time will tell. Time will tell. If you've already got Bermuda in the back lawn, once the days start getting longer and hotter, you're going to, you'll, you'll see, you'll, it'll, the grass is going to tell you. 
the grass is going to answer the question for us. Is just what I'm trying to say. Okay, so next up we have, um, uh, let me see here. We have da, 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 uh, Jimmy Miller. He says, I was looking for primarily a dithiopyr based product without um, fertilizer. Any recommendations? Uh, I guess I cannot apply until the stumps and roots have been removed within the next two to three weeks. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can get just dimension by itself. So like, yes, dithiopyr in granular often comes with, um, like there'll be like a 007 with some potassium in it, but you can buy just standalone dimension and um, that's a way to get it without any fertilizer in it if you want, you know what I mean? So it just depends on um, on what you're trying to accomplish, um, what you're trying to accomplish, uh, Jimmy. Uh, I, I don't think I have any uh, links to that, but I mean, if you just, just go out and just look around for like dimension in liquid form and that will not have, um, that will not have any um, any fertilizer in it. It will just be just the just the pre-emergent. You know what I mean? Kind of like if you go out and you buy Barricade, just like the the Barricade product by itself, it's going to be just pre-emergent. Like the, the water spiritual granule is just pre-emergent. It doesn't have any fertilizer uh, in it. So that would be a way for you to go. All right, um, Marcus uh, Como is up next. He says, how's it going, Ron? Great challenge you've got. Thanks, sir. I work hard at it. I appreciate, I really do appreciate that. It's a lot of work and I do, I do, I'm glad that you find it useful. All right, next up is always baked, never fried. <laughs> he says, good evening, Ron and fellow lawn and fellow um, lawn stripers. Turf rake today, pre-emergent tomorrow before rain here in Savannah, Georgia. How do I calibrate my new earthway spreader without wasting product or is there no other way? Really, you know, you can, what I would say is this, um, always baked, never fried. Um, the product you're applying should have, there should be a setting on the bag telling you what to set the earth weight to. And what you could do is this. You could, um, you could, if you want to be really like nerdy about it, is you could take a 20 by 50 foot section of your lawn, so a thousand square feet, and then weigh out, so get a bucket, um, and weigh out how much of the product you want to apply. So let's say you're trying to put down four pounds of whatever you're trying to apply per thousand square feet, right? You can't do exactly four pounds because when it gets to the bottom, it tends to not spread as well. So what you can do is you weigh out, say, six pounds. So take six pounds of whatever you're going to apply um, in a bucket and then add that to the um, the spreader, right? To the to your broadcast spreader. Then go out and set it based on the, the, the setting that's on the bag, walk the thousand square feet, and then when you're done, take what's left, there should be some left, there's nothing left, and the setting was wrong, but take what's left and pour that back in the bucket and weigh it. And what you should have is around two pounds, assuming that what you're trying to apply is, you know, four pounds per thousand square feet. That's, that's going to give you an idea of, um, of your, between your walking pace and the setting, if you're putting the product down at the rate that you're after. You see what I'm saying? So again, just to, to recap, Say we're trying to apply at four pounds per thousand square feet. That's the rate that we're trying to achieve. You know, you'll measure out, get some flags and measure out like a, fit, a 20 by 50 foot section in your lawn. That's a thousand square feet. Take a bucket, set it on a scale, zero it, put six pounds of whatever you're going to be applying into the bucket, um, and then pour that in the spreader. Set the spreader prop appropriately, walk that thousand foot section, and then when you're done, pour what's left over back into the bucket and weigh it. And you should have two pounds of, approximately two pounds of product left. If you did, then you're good. Your setting is between your walking pace and the setting that's, uh, that you set the spreader to, you're good to go. And if you're way off from that, then you know you can make adjustments. And that's a way of doing it without, um, you know, filling up the entire hopper and just hoping and praying that the way you're walking, the rate you're walking is gonna, is gonna be correct for putting out the right amount of product on your lawn. Does it make sense? Kind of like what you do with a with a backpack sprayer when you're trying to use a, 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 a sprayer for liquids, but you're doing it with a granular product. So hopefully that product that 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 makes sense as far as weighing out a little bit of the product, measuring out a section of the lawn, testing it, seeing how much it goes down, and then adjusting accordingly. So hope that helps. Great question. It's not one I've gotten here recently. Most people are always about, hey, how do I get my backpack sprayer to cal you know, calibrate it? But most people never, I rarely get the question about how do I ensure that I'm putting down the right amount of product using my broadcast spreader? And now you know. Not the only way to do it, but that's that's how I've done it in the past and it's worked well for me. So go with that. Uh, next up is CPIMS. He says, 
Um, I don't think I'll be doing that. Um, haha. Uh, Ron, I gotta say thank you to the to the few people from the live stream who subscribed to my channel for mentioning me uh, last week. Thank you. I appreciate it. Nice, nice, man. So it's good. It's really cool. I'm glad that you're you, know, you got your channel going and it's growing. And uh, and yeah, and if you have anything, and feel free, man. If you ever if you're ever doing anything cool or you know you, you're just like you some new content that's coming out and you want to um, you know you want me to just shout it out, feel free to to let me know. Feel free to let me know. You know, to try, I'm happy to help you. Happy to help you grow your channel, and because um, it's, it's cool, there's not a lot of content out there. Because you have um, like a, a paspalum lawn, right? I think it's what your grass is, and I don't see a lot of that grass type. So it's kind of a nice, a, kind of a nice niche, niche that you're going to be filling with that. So yeah, let you know, give you some love. Why not? So they mentioned they were from the live stream too. I did thank them for my channel. Awesome, good stuff. Glad, happy to hear that. You know, people are coming and watching the content, and uh, just keep going. It's the thing, I, the thing I will tell you is that if I can give you, if I give anyone advice on starting a YouTube channel is just keep going. Like the first, you know, unless you've done a channel in the past, like I could start a channel now from scratch and I could I could create content that could get people watching it right away. But if you're brand new, your first, your first videos are not gonna be as good as, your first you know, 20, 30 videos are not necessarily gonna be as good as the videos that come after that. So just commit to the process, keep making content, try and make every video better than the last. Like don't compare yourself to others. Just look at say, hey, I did this last time and what can I do to my next piece of content to make it um, better? And as long as you keep doing that and you don't quit, you're gonna you're gonna get to wherever you wanna go when it comes to making content on YouTube, right? Just stick with it. Uh, you are very, very welcome, um, Boom Bye. And then next up um, uh, is G Free. says, Ron, will pre-emergent affect a soil test reading? It shouldn't, not unless you're using a pre-emergent that has like fertilizer in it, right? So if you are using like a granular pre-emergent like, um, like some of the stuff that we carry on the golf course lawn store, like a 007, then that will, that will, um, yeah, that will influence like, for example, your potassium results, which is why if you're in the golf course lawn academy, we like, and the calendar that we, that we put out, like literally when I, cause in the, on the, this calendar that's on the store, it's a bit broader. I don't give actual dates, but on the calendar that's on the, um, as part of the paid program that you get, like in that one, I literally say apply, Pre, uh, I mean, do your soil test before you apply pre-emergent if you are using a granular because if you know if you're using something like a 007, you don't want that to skew your um, your results. Even here, you can kind of see. I don't particularly call it out, but even in the um, the free lawn care schedule that we offer, um, even in this one, you know, I talk about in February. It's optional. You can scalp the lawn, and then I say do a soil test, and then after that apply pre-emergent. So it's kind of like what I said, the same thing to the calendar in the academy. I just don't actually like explain the why behind why I do it that way, but that's the reason for it. Now, if you are using like barricade, like using just straight, like a, a just a straight prodiamine product or a straight pre-emergent product like prodiamine or dimension, something that does not have fertilizer in it, then it doesn't really matter. You could do your soil, you could do your prodiamine and do a soil test or you could do vice versa. Like the order doesn't really matter. But if you're going to use a pre-emergent that has fertilizer in it, to your point and your question, I think where you're going with this, Gary, it makes sense to um, get the sample prior to introducing any kind of nutrient, which a 07 does have, right? So good question. That's a good one. And again, that's why what you see on the schedule is laid out the way that it is. That's that's why I, I do it that way for a reason, because I don't know what kind of pre-emergent you guys are going to be applying. And that way, I know that you're going to be doing it in the order that makes sense to me. And hopefully after my explanation, it also makes sense to you too. All right, next up is Matt DeGoyer. He says, hey, Ron, what's going on, Matt DeGoyer? Hopefully you're doing all right. And then next up is Dan Lynch. He says, my primary goal for this season is to get all my bare spots filled in. That's a good goal, Dan. What I would tell you is if you got Bermuda grass, um, sunlight, big thing is, is sunlight, man. You get a lot, plenty of direct sunlight. Uh, that is the, the one, that's a kryptonite. That's the thing that you really can't overcome with Bermuda grass. Like if you've got a great nutrient program, you're mowing regularly, but it's in a part of the lawn where it gets a lot of shade, it's just never gonna do well. So if you've got plenty of direct sunlight and you are you know, doing, you're doing your soil testing, you're amending the soil, you're, and you're mowing, but it doesn't take a lot to get Bermuda grass to grow and really take off. At this, this time of year, it's still early, but what you'll find is when it gets into April, May timeframe, when the days get longer and you're starting to get more heat or we're getting more sunlight, days are always the same length, but like there's more sunlight throughout the day, uh, then you're gonna find the Bermuda will begin to take off and, and, and really do well. So just patience. 
Um, I know some of the stuff you've been doing and a, a lot of the, the product, a lot of the, the, the process that you're following is exactly what you should be doing. It's just a, a time thing. It's still a bit early in the season to expect the lawn to be growing in really nicely now, but I think in April, May, you're going to, you're going to like, you're going to like the results you're going to start seeing. Again, assuming you've got plenty of direct sunlight. So if you got like a bunch of trees around, a lot of, that are casting a lot of shade, like fix that now, like do something to, to resolve that because that's the one thing you really can't, um, you can't have for Bermuda grass to still have it look good is, is a lot of shade. It needs, it needs a lot of direct sunlight. It's like, like people say, well, how much sunlight? All the sunlight, like 10, 11 hours, 12, as much as you can give it. The more you give it, the better it's gonna look. All the sunlight, that's that's the correct answer when it comes from Bermuda. All, 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 all the sunlight. All right, next up is um, Mango Stumpy here on Instagram. He says, my Bermuda is starting to barely wake up. Just noticeable the last few days. I'm getting excited. Still waiting to scalp too soon. Hard to hold off. Well, yeah, man. It's I mean, it's still early in the season, guys. It's, we're in the second week of February. So, yes, I'm glad that, the you know, in your, depending on where you guys are in the country, the lawns are beginning to wake up and starting to look good and get you encouraged. But if anything is, you know, if history repeats itself, like last year, you know, we are going to get some more cool weather between now and when it's completely go time. So just, I, I just want to level set. I don't want you guys, you don't want there to be a bunch of depression setting in if we get like a winter blast and then like, oh, my, my lawn was looking all green and now all the green's gone back to brown and I don't know what to do. So I just want to, just want to level set that while it's looking good now, don't, you know, there's, it's like, it's, it's highly likely we're going to get some, some, some ups and downs between now and, and go time. All right, Bill Stewart is up next. She says, my wife drove from Tennessee to Real Rollers yesterday. She was afraid I got scammed on my pre-order. She talked to Lee and Isaac who told her I'd get my more in April. She was impressed. Yeah, so here's the thing, guys. I, I know when it comes to the revolution, I mean, uh, talking to Lee and, and the team there that, that are behind it, like the goal was to have the mower out in um, like now, like beginning, like January timeframe. And again, I'm not affiliated with Real Rollers. I, I, I'm just telling you what I know, but I can, but given that I, I've seen the more when it was in development um, and had conversations with them and a lot of things that they were trying to, to get into it to make it the best possible more they could for you guys. Um, the reason for the delays, a couple of things, it's like there's like shipping delays. I think something about, like something going on with the Panama Canal to where it just takes longer to get stuff shipped through now. Um, and then there's also some, um, like there's changes they wanted to make. Like as they began developing the more and more and more, they're saying, man, you know, it'd be really cool if we could add this and a few other features to it. And the decision was made to rather than put something out that is still going to would have been a great mower, but wasn't like represented like their level best of what like their best effort. The decision was made to do that. And it means that you have to wait a little bit longer to get it, which I mean, I get it. I mean, I, when I order, trust me, I'm that guy. Whenever I order something, like I'm the one looking for tracking after I order it and I'm just, I'm waiting and I'm looking, I'm, I'm waiting for it to show up. You know what I mean? So I, I completely get that people, you know, they buy a mower and it's not a small amount of money. And um, and you want it right away, but I I I think you guys are gonna be happy with it when you get it. It's gonna be worth the wait. Like a lot a lot of work, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears has gone into um is to getting it as good as they can. And for a first um I say like a Rev One product, I think you guys are gonna be impressed because remember it's a lot of you get in the in the revolution. The thing I liked about it, and when Alex and I got to to mow with it. Is it's got a bit of it's got a bit of everything in it, right? It doesn't have the interchangeable cartridge system, but it's got a bit of it's got a bit of greens mower in it. It's got um it's got a lot of the ruggedness of like some of the more commercial or, or like more like the residential mowers like your like your true cuts um have. So it's got a, it's got a lot. It's got like it's got the the the. The, the stuff that you want, but not the stuff you do that you don't necessarily need. Like if I could, in other words, if I were gonna like do a wish list and say, I'm gonna build a mower that, um, you know, save having an interchangeable cartridge system um, that that is gonna be like under three grand and is gonna, you know, check all these different boxes, um, you know, a, a, rear, a, a rear drum, because as far as your stripes, guys, that's a huge, huge contributing factor to getting great stripes. So, so a rear drum, um, they've got it. It's got like, I think it's like vulcanized rubber on it. So it climbs better of a, a grooved roller on the front. You got the, um, the Honda engine. I mean, it's like, as far as checking all the boxes, like if I were in the market for a mower now, that is what I would buy. Like, as a matter of fact, like my, my true cut is still down because I can't get a clutch for it. And if and I can't find one between now and whenever I got to start like regularly mowing, I might end up with a revolution. I very well could end up with one of them. So it's, it's, I mean, I get it. Like you want your mower and, and I, I am, I am with you, man. Like I'm, I am not patient when it comes to like when I order stuff, I like, I want it when I want it. 
Um, but I think you guys are going to be really happy with it once you do get your hands on it. I mean, it's it's there. They're trying to make it as good as possible. I know that literally there are, the mowers are in route now. That's what you know. Lee was talking to me about. Like they're literally on the water, like steaming towards steaming towards America. So you guys will have them. You guys will have them soon. And again, I, I think you're really going to like it. You're going to like the equipment. All right, so next up is Dan Lynch. He says, I know mowing often is required, but what else uh, to get the grass to spread aggressively? Um, well, the things, the other things you can't really control. So mowing, um, which is important, um, and a good nutrient program. So make sure that it's getting enough nitrogen. Uh, that's going to help the grass spread uh, spread natural, uh, spread aggressively. If you are also want to use like a growth regulator like Primo, that also helps promote lateral growth. Like instead of the, the lawn, the grass growing tall, it tends to creep and grow. It becomes more dense, tends to creep out. Um, so yeah, I would say that, I mean, it's too early now, Dan, but whenever the, the lawn does fully wake up, consider adding a growth regulator like Primo Max to your program. As a matter of fact, I might have, I might be able to show you here like what I'm talking about is like what the density in the density that Primo can make to grass. All right, cool. So here we are. So this is uh, the Primo Max product description. And um, this is a, a, a grass without Primo, right? And this is grass with Primo. And these these are taken, so the 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 grass on the right is a grass that's under regulation and that um, and the grass on the left is the neighbor next to this um, this lawn where they were not using Primo Max. So as far as getting the lawn to thicken up and just get denser, you can see the difference in between them, right? You can see how much how much uh, how much tighter and how much denser how much how much denser the leaf is uh, with the lawn with the with the grass that's under regulation versus the one that is not. So I would say in addition to mowing, once the lawn is filling in, if you want to use growth regulator, that's also a great tool as well to help the lawn thicken up as well, Dan. So. Uh, Primo, great product. I always say life before it and life after it. It's a great investment in your lawn care program. I absolutely um, would would recommend uh, Primo Max. Uh, next up is um, Bill Stewart. I was a little disappointed she was turned down. She turned down the tour. And I was a little disappointed she turned down the tour and test drive a mower on the turf park, though. <laughs> well, here's the thing, Bill. She's not as excited as you are. I mean, she she listen, she went down here, she drove down from Tennessee to make sure that, hey, is this real roller is really a place? And, you know, you know, am I am I actually gonna get a piece of equipment here? She was not, I I I mean, here's the thing, bless her heart for doing that. But I I I think it's probably too much of an ask to say, hey, while you're down there, go ahead and lay some stripes on the Zoysia in Bermuda. I mean, it's that's probably asking a bit much. Probably asking a bit much, you know what I mean? But here's the good news is that um, I was talking to Lee today and he said that there is a plan this spring to do the party, to do the turf park party. So I, I don't know exactly when. I think it's going to be at some point in April. I, I believe like later in April. Um, don't quote me on that because you still got to figure the dates out. But in the late spring, early summer time is when the plan is to have the turf park where you guys are going to be able to come out and mow Bermuda and two different types of zoysia and just have a grand old time talking about mowers and cutting grass and all that stuff, right? So, uh, so you will have your chance to come down and do it yourself, you know. So don't, uh, don't, don't pass it up once, once he announces it. All right. Next up is uh, C Pims Colin. He says, uh, "My McLean is sitting here with a sad face, waiting to roam free and cut that pass for him. It'll be time soon. Just you don't, you know, let your, not, don't let your heart be troubled. You know, the McLean is going to get to be fired up soon, and it's going to, it'll, it'll get out there and do the business on the, on the pass for him." You already got it tricked out. You got your, your groove roller on it. So just wait. Patience. Patience is the order of the day. You will uh, be out there before you know it mowing the lawn. I wouldn't, I really wouldn't sweat it. Archie's up next. He says, uh, evening, young man. There's been a lot of chatter across several groups that I belong to about the use of glyphosate on Bermuda lawns. It is non-selective, so won't it kill the grass as well as weeds? Yes, yes it will, it absolutely will. So here, here's the thing, Archie. If your Bermuda grass, your Bermuda lawn is truly dormant, right? Truly dormant, 100% dormant through and through, and you wanna use glyphosate to try and control weeds, can you do that? Yes, technically you can. Here's the thing. I have seen a lawn, personally, that was dormant by all appearances looked, appeared to be dormant. And the, the owner went out and they sprayed glyphosate. They used it to clean up some weeds in the lawn. I think they're trying to clean up some POA in the lawn and all was fine and good. The POA died, but then you know what happened whenever we got around to like March, April timeframe, the spots in the lawn where they sprayed the POA where the Bermuda was dormant, they had dead spots in the lawn and it, and it didn't recover till later in the season. 
So for that reason, I don't I don't tell people to spray non-selective herbicides like glyphosate on grasses they care about. Like the only benefit, the only benefit to using glyphosate to control weeds on dormant grass, in my opinion, is that it's less expensive. It's cheap, you know, but it's, it's to me, it's not worth the risk. Like if you're trying to control POA on a bermudalon, use certainty. You're trying to control broadleaf on a bermudalon, use, you know, Celsius. Can you use glyphosate? And some people will they'll, they'll jockey with it. They'll try and back the race down a little bit to try and, you know, to, to minimize the chance of injury. Can you? Sure. But I mean, it's one of these things that have, of it only works if it works. And if it doesn't work, you're going to have a damaged lawn. And, you know, you will, you'll look back and say, you know what? I should have spent the, you know, the, the, the $20, $21 for a, for a, a packet of, of Celsius, or I should have spent, you know, the hundred bucks, 120 bucks for the, for a, a, a bottle of certainty and done it the right, in my opinion, the right way and not take the chance of, of causing injury to your lawn. So, Again, there's people that do it, um, but I again, but there's people that do it, but but every year on those same groups, you're gonna find that there are people that, that also damage their lawns in the process. You know what I mean? So I I don't I personally don't think it's worth it. It's your it's your call whether you want to try it or not. Again, the only reason, in my opinion, the only reason to do that, the only benefit you're really doing is you're just saving a bit of money because glyphosate tends to be cheaper than um, than selective herbicides, but that's for a reason because the selective herbicides will control the weeds while minimizing the chance of injury to your grass, whereas glyphosate is a steamroller and will damage and or kill anything that it comes in contact with. So I just, for that reason, to me, it's not worth it, which is why I don't tell people to do that. Because again, if your lawn's completely dormant, could you do it and get away with it? Sure. But I mean, how do you know it's completely dormant? Like if someone comes on the live stream and says, hey, you're on my lawn's completely dormant. Can I spray glyphosate on it? And I say, yeah, but do, how do I know? I, I don't, I'm not looking at their lawn. You know, if you you pull the grass back, is there, there's no green down there at all? You know, is it fully checked out? So it's just not, I don't tell people to do that because I just don't want people to get mad at me later on saying, oh, I tried, I did, you know, I, I sprayed glyphosate in my lawn when I thought it was dormant and now I got like dead spots in my lawn. Like, don't do that. Just use, use a selective herbicide um, to control the weeds, and that is a a better way to go. So, it's your your call. Hopefully, my logic is and as to why I don't do that and why I don't tell people to do that makes sense. But it's it's ultimately up to you which way you um you want to go. Just realize that it only works if it works, and it doesn't work, you're gonna have dead spots in your lawn that's gonna take a while to recover from, and you're gonna regret doing it. So, it's your call. I personally wouldn't. All right, next up is um, WJM41 says, good grass to mix with Bermuda in shadier areas of a yard in South Carolina. Uh, I mean, Bermuda is not gonna grow in shade, like full stop, it's just not gonna do well in shade. So as far as grass types that will do better in shade, like fescues, particularly fine fescue, does better in shade than warm season grasses like Bermuda. So I would not, um, like if you're gonna try and do an area of your lawn that is like Bermuda just won't grow there. A couple of options are one, just decide, hey, I'm just not gonna have grass in that part of the lawn. That's an option. And you could do like shrubs or some kind of decoration or expand the mulch bed to make it look like decorative, make it look nice. That's an option. Or you could do like fescue in that area, but it's gonna look different. You know what I mean? So if it, I'd say that's a good plan if you, um, like if you have a, if you have like the 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 area that's shaded to say is like the back lawn or is the side of the lawn where people can't really see it to where in other words if you're standing at the street and you're looking at the lawn and you're not going to be able to see the Bermuda and the area where you're talking about doing introducing this other grass then that's less bad but if you're talking about where you're going to be able to sit back and look at the lawn and from the street and you're going to see Bermuda and then see this other grass like a fescue because they do look very different um, then. I don't know that I would I would do that. It's really your call whether much uh, whether that's going to bug you or not. Um, so um, so yeah. But to answer the question, there's not really like shade tolerant Bermuda is not really a thing. Not in the way that people are thinking about. Like people think that you know they can plant Bermuda grass under like a big oak tree and that it's going to do fine. And that's just not just not going to be the case. Like you're going to want to go with like a a fescue, particularly a fine fescue, if that's what you're. Um, you're 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 going for so hope that helps um, WGM four um, and yeah and fescue does does well in the south like you know if you look at um like it if you go to like to Buckhead or like Buckhead or Vinings area like some parts of like the older older parts of Atlanta where you have like like a lot of really big trees in the lawns in the yards and there's like a lot like like yards where they're heavily shaded like those people don't have Bermuda lawns they have fescue lawns and they look great and they do well it does well in the summertime because 
you got these big trees, you got this big canopy that's keeping a lot of the heat from really burning out and drying out the lawn. So fescue can work well. You may have to put a bit more water on it during summer months, but that that would be what I would say to do if you are looking for a, a to have grass in a shaded area of the lawn. I would not try and mix Bermuda with it because it's not going to look good. Okay, uh, next up we got um, James Smith. Is it for me? No, I don't think so. It's something, someone, something else. He's having a sidebar. All right, McNasty Motorsports is up next. He says, like button has been aer has been aerated and a fresh coat of paint applied. So eager to scalp. I feel like that uh, Chappelle meme. Y'all get any more of that mowing season? Yeah, I hear you. I hear you, McNasty. Hey, dude, I saw your, your um the, the car you posted on Instagram. It's mean, man. The stance was nasty. Kind of like your name, McNasty Motorsports. Um, it's pretty sweet. Nice. I, I just saw it. Like, I still like cars. So I, I, I saw the one you posted. I was like, man, that's... That's a mean looking ride, man. You got the picture just right too. All right, next up we have uh, Jonathan uh, Carmardo says, um, I ordered Dithiapir from the Golf Course Lawn Store this fall. The Yard Mastery spray it. it is no longer on the website. Will you be getting more Dithiapir? Yes, yes, we will. As a matter of fact, um, if you look, Jonathan, over the, this weekend, by Monday we should have it in. By Monday you'll, you'll see it um, available for purchase on the website. So if you go here, if you go to the golf course lawn store, you go to shop and then go to weed killer and then you search for pre-emergent. We're getting two um, two pre-emergents um, in Prodiamine. One is like a, a, a Prodiamine product like that that will that will replace this one. And then the other one is dimension slash dithiapir. Um, so we're going to have both of these in early next week. You're going to be able to order them. Um, and then, so if you look over the weekend, um, it, they might become live for, for order. Um, but, this, but these literally are going to become available early next week. So if you are looking for these, um, Jonathan, the best way to do is, is to get to click here, click on Dimension, and then click on this link that says Notify Me When, when Available. As soon as it comes in stock, you're going to get an email saying, Hey, Jonathan, we have Dithiapir, aka Dimension. Come buy it. And uh, you'll be you'll be good to go. So this is literally in route now, and you'll be good to go as far as um, as far as both of these. And we'll be able to ship both of these all because the the problem with um with this while it's a great product, um, there's a lot there. As far as some of the states where we can ship it to, due to like shipping costs, um, that's limited. So if you're out in California, we can't ship this to California. Whereas these we will be able to. Actually, I'm not sure what I did with the filters here. Let me go back and show and do that. Yeah, whereas these, we will we'll be able to ship these to um, to more places. So um, you'll see these on the store here early next week, and then you'll be able to get them pretty much anywhere that you want pre-emergent, um, other than the, the few states where you can't sell um, dithiapir. So so hope that helps, uh, Jonathan. It It is being worked on, noted. Please um, go ahead and like click on that link, and I'll actually, you know, I'll make it easy for you. I'll send you this here. Sign up here to be notified when, it, when, it's, um, when it's in stock. And again, it'll... You know, it'll be in stock early next week, shipping next week, and then you'll be on your way. So thanks. Um, thanks for that. You're going to get, you know, again, we have we have a new offering that's going to be available here soon. So good stuff. Thanks for the question. Uh, next up is Miles Blaine. So we have a question here on Instagram. He says, last few seasons, I've really struggled with POA. I typically do split outs for Prodiamine in February, May, and October. It's keeping other cool season weeds away, but not POA. What could I change? Yeah, so great question, Miles. So if you're trying to control POA, really, and you're trying to control POA using Prodiamine, doing a split app in like late August, early September, and then doing another one in December is what you're going to want to aim for. Doing it, like in other words, like February, like now, it's way too late to control POA. Like if you're doing a, uh, an app of Prodiamine now to with the goal of controlling POA annua, um, you're not going to get, it's not going to really do much for you. Same thing for doing the application in May. Not really going to do a whole lot against Poanio. Really, in May, with, when temperatures get hotter, Poanio should begin dying off. But your February and May pre-emergent apps, assuming that's when you're doing them, that is more for your spring and summer weeds, whereas Poanio, you really control that in the fall. So the Poa you're seeing now began germinating months ago. It's just now starting to show up because temperatures are getting a little bit more, a bit warmer. So you would do, if you can do, again, if you do Prodiamine, you're going to want to do a split app in, again, September, another one in December, or... Um, what kind of grass do you have? You said keeping other cool season weeds away. Yeah. So if you have warm season grass, just get to skip Prodiamine and just go with this. Go with Spectacle Flow. Like this stuff is what you want to use if you hate Poanua in your warm season grass. Like this will, will do the trick. 
again, I have not found anybody that's, that's switched to Spectacle from Prodiamine or Dimension and has written and says, man, I use that stuff and I still got tons of breakthroughs. There's Poe everywhere. Like everyone writes back and says, oh man, this has been a godsend. It's expensive, but it sure does work. And I'm like, yep. Kind of kind of like how most things are in life, right? Like you, you know, good, good and cheap is um not normally not normally a thing. So if you want something that's gonna be really good, you typically you're gonna pay for it. And and it's a um it's it's a great product. So that's what I would go with if you really are you really care about keeping Poe out of your lawn. So again, special flow, we do carry this on the golf course lawn store, so you can pick some up. And the time to apply it uh, really is like late August, early September. That's gonna that's gonna produce a really good result. And it's your call whether you want to do a single app or you could do what I did this past year, a split app. So you do one in early September and then another one in um, December, and that's gonna you're gonna be in great shape for for keeping Poa in your um, out of your lawn. Okay, uh, next up is Eric uh, C. Eric C is in the house. He says. Um, Ron, I live in Western Washington State. Uh, my grass is Kentucky bluegrass and fireball. I don't know what fireball is, but it sounds cool. It's a cool name for grass. He said, I noticed some POA spots coming in the other day. I usually just walk around and dig them out. Is there a pre-emergent option? Yes. So that's the thing for warms, for cool season grass, there's not a lot of great options for controlling POA once it's around. Um, as for pre-emergent, you can use prodiamine, but you're gonna do kind of like what I was telling Miles is you're gonna do a split application. So in the fall, one app normally isn't gonna be enough. So you can do one like earlier in the fall and then another one later in the fall. That's gonna do you know as good a job as you can expect to for, for reducing the amount of POA that you um that you get in in your cool season lawn. The thing to keep in mind though with this is that a lot of you cool season folks in like you know August, September time frame, you love to overseed your lawns. And if you're gonna plan if you're planning to do that, pre-emergence gonna work against you. So you, you have to kind of make a decision. Do you, I mean, first of all, do you even need to overseed? Because a lot of you guys don't really need to do it. It's just kind of a habit thing. But if you don't need to overseed your lawn and keeping POA or at least severely reducing the amount of POA you have in your lawn is the main goal, then prodiamine, like a split up of prodiamine in the fall is what I would, um, is what I would do. Um, because again, if you do, if you apply a pre-emergent um, and then you try and overseed the lawn, you're gonna get, you're not going to get great results as far as um, the grass growing and as far as germination goes. So you have to kind of pick what's more important to you, like new grass or less weeds. And most people, while they want to say new grass, like weeds are the thing that bother more people, um, bother people more than than um, than getting you know growing new grass in their lawn. So it's really your call. Um, I would I would plan for that this fall, like a split application of of prodiamine. That's gonna that's gonna do a lot for reducing the amount of poa that you get. You cannot use like the product I'm talking about and I'm saying, oh, it's like the greatest thing since sliced bread, spectacle flow, you should absolutely use it. You can't use that on cool season grass. So for in your case, Prodiamine is gonna be, is gonna be your jam. So hope that helps, sir. Sorry you're dealing with that. And what you're doing is what I would do. I mean, just keep, you can keep digging it out. Some people will get like, um, will get like a paintbrush or a sponge with glyphosate and like, 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 you know, carefully spot apply it just to the POA. That's an option too. But I mean, if you're gonna do all that, you may as well just, just dig it out and just, just keep going at it. You know what I mean? Um, something else you can do is if it's, if you've got a lot of POA annua and you're trying to hide it to where it doesn't show up quite as much is uh, you can use growth regulator, right? So the thing that makes POA look particularly ugly, I mean, in our lawns, it looks ugly because everything else is brown and it's the only green thing in the lawn. But in your cool season lawns, the thing that really makes it stand out are the white seed heads that it throws off. So you can use Primo Max um, as a way to suppress the seed heads, which is actually on the label. Um, that's one of the things that it discusses on the label as far as one of the use cases for a Primo. You could do that and it's gonna, yes, you're still gonna have the POA, but it's not gonna be as apparent um, versus if you did not use a, uh, a growth regulator. Something else to try is not something people often think about when they when it comes to, as a use case for, for Primo, but that is, that's some, that's a, a strategy you can use to where, yes, the pole will be in your lawn, but it's not gonna be as apparent, not gonna look as ugly, because you're not gonna have the seed heads um, nearly as much versus if you didn't use a growth regulator. So hope that helps. And if you need anything else, let me know. All right, next up is It's Me. He says, what do you use for mosquitoes? Great question. What I use, do I have a bottle of it here? Do I? I don't think I do, maybe I do. I do, I do, I got one. So what I use for mosquitoes is this stuff, which is the Miramichi Green Non-Toxic Pest Control. This stuff is great for mosquitoes, chinch bugs, ants, what else is on here? I can look on the label. Mosquitoes, ants, noceums, roaches, ticks, aphids, white flies, fleas, chinch bugs, and more. So this is a non-toxic product. The nice thing about it is you can spray it, you know, you can spray it on 
on your patio, shrubs, um, you know, the side of the house, gutters, and uh, it's it's a great product. As far as the effectiveness, it works for about three weeks, three to four weeks. So, um, but it's it's a great, excellent product for um, for mosquitoes. So the idea is, say you had like company coming over, you could go out, you could spray this the morning of, you know, and then you're good to go. You're not gonna really have a lot of mosquitoes um, after after using this. And the nice thing about it is that um, because it relies on oils and soaps and, they, and their, their blend, um, the, the insects that it targets can't form resistance to it like they can some other, like some other synthetic insecticides, right? So this is what I would go with. If you're, if you're trying to look for a product to control mosquitoes and a whole bunch of other stuff in your lawn in a, um, in an environmentally conscious way. So where you can find that is if you go to shop and then you go to fungicide and insecticide and you scroll down, you will find it right here. The Miramichi Green Pest Control, available in one gallon and two and a half gallon sizes, depending on the size of your lawn and how much you wanna spray and how much you want the stuff you wanna have. Great product. There is, I think I have a video here. There's a video here that talks about how I like to mix and use it. And um, I think you'll be very happy with the with the results. It also smells good too. It's got like a like a lemon lemon like citrus um, smell to it. So there is that. So if you, I'll send you a link here to where you can pick that up. It's me. And uh, again, I think you'll be very you'll be quite happy with um, with the product. All right. So there you go. Okay. Uh, next up, we have um, Sokin Kenth. He says, um, great info and have watched your, a lot of your old videos. Question, Bermuda Lawn here. Is it a good thing to add humic acid now before the growing season? Thank you. Yeah, it can't, it's not gonna hurt. It's almost like saying, like adding biochar now um, before the growing season. Is it, a, is it helpful? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's not a bad thing to do. Um, I, I'll tell you, um, I'm, and I apologize for butchering your name, so, so crinth. Um, I tend to, outside of, um, of Essential G, which is the granular biostimulant that I use, I tend to hold off on liquid biostimulants until like March timeframe, until like next month, right? Um, but it's it's completely your your call. If you live in a part of the country, I know you've got Bermuda, but if you live somewhere where your lawn's beginning to wake up and you wanna go out and, and, and apply some humic acid or spray some humic acid, then by all means, uh, go for it. I mean, I, I'll tell you how much um, I like humic acid and how much I'm a believer in biostimulants. Like the, the very first fertilizer, that we carried from Lebanon Turf, if you go to Shop and Lawn Fertilizer, is this product called Humic Max. And this, this product is like literally, it's nitrogen, potassium, and it's 8.9%, almost 9% humic acid. So it's almost, it's like applying a fertilizer and a biostimulant at the same time. So yes, this is, literally this is what I use on my lawn primarily um, throughout the growing season. So. Um, so yes, can you apply a humic acid? Sure. Um, are there, I mean, is it gonna hurt anything? No, but um, like I'm not gonna be start using humic max really until um, until April. So I'll start with the 12 0 24 first, and then I will switch to humic max and I'll run that until the fall. So great question. Glad you found the content useful. Hopefully the answer was um, was helpful for you. All right, we are moving on. We're moving on and moving on. And moving on. Um, next up, we have a question here from David um, uh, Bear. He says, one more question. Do you have any tips uh, or opinions on adding pelletized gypsum to clay soil in North Georgia? Yeah, so so gypsum, I mean, there's not, there's not any real negatives to it as far as it being a, um, you know, helping to reduce compaction. Uh, I think so. Um, my soil, like Soil Lab, has done some testing on that, and it's. I didn't think the results are really conclusive. It's not going to hurt anything, but I don't know that you're necessarily going to get the, you know, like get like life changing results just by introducing uh, gypsum, some gypsum to your soil profile. If you're trying to improve like a heavy clay soil, what I would say is aeration once you know we get a little bit further into the season, and then consider a top dressing with a sand and um, soil blend. So don't just do 100% sand, do like a 70-30 like blend of, of sand and a rich compost to help, to help improve the, uh, the soil profile near the surface. That is what I would, um, I would say to do. So I'm not sure what you're trying to accomplish with the, with the gypsum. And you said, uh, is tenacity mesotrion in the fall uh, for cool season turf? Yeah, so tenacity, it's not really, so as far, you said, and for poannua. Yeah, so they, 
if you look at the label for tenacity, it, it has like poenia for suppression. Like tenacity can behave as a pre-emergent for about three to four weeks, but it's not like a, it's really like a specialty herbicide. It can behave as like a, as a post-emergent um, or pre-emergent depending on how you apply it. Um, but if you look at the label, it's labeled to suppress poannua, so help limit how much of it grows in, but it's not, um, it's not, if the po's already growing in your lawn, it's not going to do a whole lot for you as far as, uh, as far as getting rid of it. If your question is, would I use tenacity as my pre-emergent in the fall? No. I would use it as part of a seeding project. So let's say you got a, a you're doing a renovation in the fall and you're looking to control weeds and prevent new weeds from going in for a few weeks while you are putting about to put out some grass seed and get that to grow in. That is where tenacity shines. Like it's 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 excellent for that. Like it's part of a seeding project. That's that's where it's it's bread and butter. But as far as a as far as like a traditional pre-emergent like dithiopyr, like prodiamine, like pendimethalin, like like spectacle, it's not the same thing. You know what I mean? So it's um so hopefully that helps David as far as answering your question. In other words, if you're trying to keep POA out of your lawn in the fall, I would not use tenacity. I would use like prodiamine. It's got a lot longer. It, it works for a lot longer than uh, than tenacity does. Does that make sense? So uh, hopefully you find that useful. Any other questions? Uh, let me know. It's a good question. Okay, next up is Melvin Otta. Melvin Otta is in the house. He says, hey, Ron, can you share the granular spreader that you use? I want to buy one. Thank you. So what you were talking about, Melvin, is the venerable Earthway 2050P. 2050P. That is my favorite spreader of choice. I will um, I'll send you a link here to where you can grab one. But the 2050P is awesome for a lot of reasons. But the reason why I'm a big fan of it is that it's a good... Um, it's a good prosumer spreader in the sense that it's not going to be quite as expensive as like some of the like the five hundred dollars spreaders that you can buy, um, but it's um, it's because I call it prosumer from the standpoint that if you go out and you look at a bag of Humic Max or any of Syngenta's granular products or any any like pro type products, um, you're going to see a setting on the bag for um, for a for a a, a an Earthway, for an Earthway spreader, right? For Earthway rotary. So for that reason, just for like reducing the, the hassle factor, um, that is why I'm a huge fan of it. Plus you got the earth, the, the airfield tires. I mean, it's a quality spreader. Like mine has been great. Like I, I like it so much that I had one before that I got like in 2018. I gave that one to Alex and I bought another one of the exact same thing. So it's a great spreader. Are there other ones out there that you can get that are good? Yes. But the 2050P, in my opinion, I mean, you, you'd be hard pressed to do better than it. The only thing I would tell you is that with the new ones, like the one that I had before didn't do this, but the new ones, whenever you take it out of the box, it comes pretty much assembled. You have to fold the handles up and then tighten two wing nuts and you're, away, you're off to go. The one thing I would, I would tell you is, um, the, at least on my model, the wing nuts that I had did not, they weren't nylock, meaning that they will, like they'll, they'll get loose um, with um, with vibration. So if you get yourself some blue Loctite, so go like to Home Depot or somewhere else and get yourself some blue Loctite, and whenever you take it out of the box, put like a drop of blue Loctite <coughs> on each of those bolts and then tighten the wing nut over it, let it sit, and then you're good to go. And then it won't loosen up and you'll be fine. Um, only other thing to think about is if you can get yourself some cotter pins, like the only thing that will break on that spreader that I have found is there, it's driven by a cotter pin that goes through I forget which wheel it is, but it goes through one of the wheels and through the axle, and that's what drives the whole mechanism that makes the spreader work. And those will eventually shear off. So you can, a couple of options is you can either go out and just buy and have a stack of cotter pins on you, or kind of a cool hack is you can take a clothes hanger, which is a bit thicker material, quite a bit thicker material, and this is harder than a cotter pin, and you can cut that and make your own, and then you're gonna be good to go. Then pretty much it's gonna be a bulletproof spreader. You never have to worry about anything. So um, so I linked it in the chat there. That is the one I would go with. You know about all the little gotchas that I figured out with it over the years, and it's, it's a great spreader. I really I really like mine. I really like mine. I like it so much I bought two of them. So I um, so hope that helps. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Jimmy Miller says, any recommendations for a lawn leveling rake? I plan on ordering a leveling mix from Supersod. Uh, yeah, so there's, a, there's two that I have direct experience with. There is the standard golf rake, and then there is the one from R&R. So I have the one for, I have the one from R and R, um, but the one from Standard Golf is also good too. So I'll send you a link to um, one of them, and the other one you have to just go to R and R's website and find it. But um, either one of those will work well. Here's the thing: there's a lot of there's a lot of leveling rakes out there, and you can get 
you can get like the super cheap ones. And I, what I would tell you is that it's one of those tools that you're just not gonna really replace. You're like you're, you're gonna buy one and for the most part, it's gonna stick around for, um, for years and years and years and years and years. Like loving rakes also have other uses too. Like if you're someone that, say so you don't turf rake your lawn to where you get like some you know, thatch buildup or just debris buildup in your lawn. And say if you mulch into your lawn quite a bit um, and you get a heavy rainstorm, you guys ever see you'll get like the zebra stripes or like the little clumps of like dead grass that kind of build up on the lawn after a heavy rainstorm. Leveling rakes are incredible for getting rid of those. Like you take it out there and you just kind of run it over that and it will break up all the all that um that that those those grass clippings those grass clumps and work it in and you won't even really see it anymore. So outside of leveling the lawn, which is really what it's designed for, there are other uses for them. So I would say spend a few extra dollars and get a good one because again, you're not really going to replace it once you you have it. Like my one I have, my one from RNR, I've had it for I don't I don't know. I, I'll, I've had it a long time and it's it still still works great. Um and I, it's been through a lot of lawn levelings. It's leveled my lawn, Alex's lawn has been through a lot of work. And, uh, and again, the Sandra Golf one is also good too. But either one of those you won't be unhappy with as far as an option. So hope that helps, Jimmy. And if you need anything else, don't hesitate to uh, to reach out. But uh, but yeah, get a good leveling rig. Don't get a cheap one. Because honestly, the price difference between a good one and like a not good one is normally less than 50 bucks. And the amount of frustration and headache you're gonna save yourself by getting a better one is worth it. Because there's a thing too, like there's never, kind of like a mower, there's never a good time for your lawnmower to break down. Like there's never a good time for your leveling rake to break. Because what's gonna happen is if it breaks, it's gonna be like mid leveling, right? You're gonna be out there leveling the lawn or doing like moving sand around and it breaks and then it all comes to a standstill when you could've spent a little bit more and gotten a good one and that wouldn't have happened. So that's my, get off my soapbox now on like buying a um, buying a good tool. Like buy once, cry once when it comes to tools. Like nothing, there's nothing more expensive than a cheap tool. All right, next up is Juan Rodriguez. He says, hey Ron, I live in Duluth, Georgia, Gwinnett County. And I, am I too late to apply pre-emergent? No, you are not. You're not too late at all. I haven't ordered it as yet. The predominant from your website, will it be too late when it arrives? And could I use, okay, first of all, let me ask your first question. No, it's not too late to apply pre-emergent. You can go to the golf course lawn store. We've got it in stock. You can order it and you'll likely have it before the end of next week. Like if you order it today or tomorrow, you'll likely have it before the end of next week, given that you're in Georgia. Um, so no, it's not too late to apply pre-emergent, but I really wouldn't wait. There's no reason to really wait much longer, especially given that you're in Georgia. Next question is, Anne, can I use Spectacle Flow other than Prodiamine? You can, but I really wouldn't recommend it for the a pre-emergent in the springtime. Um, like Spectacle Flow is an excellent fall pre-emergent, when especially when the grasses that it's designed to work with are beginning to go dormant. But if you use it in the spring, um, it'll work. But you, what you might find is you might find a slightly later or slightly delayed green up using Spectacle in the spring versus in the fall. Plus. I, I'm a fan of rotating pre-emergence um, between spring and fall, because if you do it, let's put, say for example, you did that, right? Let's say you use Spectacle in the fall. Uh, you gotta be really careful to ensure that you've left enough to be able to use it again in the springtime. So it's kind of it's the, like you asking this question is like, if you ask me, can I use Prodiamine as my spring pre-emergent and my fall pre-emergent? Technically, yes, but I'm not a fan of doing that because um, one, it's, it's a good idea to rotate them. And then also the rates that you have to apply the product at to be able to not exceed annual limits and still apply in the spring and fall and get a great result is not, it tends to not work out that well. So what I would say is use Spectacle as your fall pre-emergent. That is really where it shines and use something else for the springtime. So Prodiamine or Dithiapir. And to answer your question, you can still order it. It's not gonna be too late. When you get it, you're gonna be fine. Just apply it when you get it and then move on with life. All right, good, good question, um, Juan. And you said you have common Bermuda, no problem at all. It'll work just fine on common Bermuda. It'll work fine on, on pretty much all grass types. So I mean, talking about prodiamine anyway. So uh, so yeah, go ahead and get your order in and uh, apply it once it comes in and you should be all set. All right, next up is always Bickner Fry says, that makes perfect sense about the way to calibrate my spreader without wasting product. I am using Barricade and they do have the Earthway spreader setting rate. Thank you. Yeah, so so the, the rate that's on the bag should be, should be pretty close, but if you just want to test it and see also, hey, maybe the rate on the bat or the rate for the spreader setting is correct, but maybe you're someone that walks a bit slower, you're someone that walks a bit faster. That's where you know you're going up maybe half a setting, you're coming down half a setting. You can kind of figure out like what's right for you based on your walking pace to ensure you're putting out, you know, however many pounds 
of product you want to apply per thousand square feet. So again, if your goal is like four thousand four pounds per thousand square feet, I've already gone through the whole process, but like inch, like take make a small area and test it based on how you walk and see if that's you know you're getting you're getting close to that. That's how I would do it without wasting a bunch of product, without over applying or under applying the product. Okay, uh, next is, um, let's see here. We got Julius Elias. He says, when should I put uh, my 12024 fertilizer down in Florida? My soil temperature is 61. So, it, you know, Julius, I'm gonna be doing mine in March. I'm gonna be applying mine in March. I don't know where you are in Florida, but given that Florida tends to be quite a bit further ahead than we are because of the temperatures you guys have, if you want to do it or apply it in March, that would be fine too. I mean, when, when the lawn is beginning to wake up and it's starting to grow, that's when you can introduce uh, that fertilizer. So March is when I'm doing mine. Y if you wanted to do the same thing, you're you're likely to be okay, given that you're in uh, you're in Florida. All right, uh, da, 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 da. let me see, Jimmy's got a question here. He says, Ron, once I have my lawn level, there are parts where the Bermuda might not fill in due to the, the crepe myrtle tree, thinking about ordering some zoysia plugs to fill in those areas. Any ideas? Depends on how much shade, man. I mean, the big thing is, is that even though zoysia is, bit, is more shade tolerant than Bermuda, it still needs sunlight to do well. So I, without knowing how much shade you're really dealing with, it's, it's hard to say that, Bermuda, that the zoysia is gonna thrive in an area where Bermuda would not. It really depends on how much, uh, how much shade you have. So you could try it. You know, you could um, you could try it and see, and and if that doesn't work, your choices are like raise the canopy on the crepe myrtle, just even get more sunlight there, and and uh, just adjust adjust accordingly. Like every lawn is different, and without seeing the amount of shade that your lawn gets during the growing season, it's a really difficult question to answer to say like yeah, but like zoysia should do okay there, or nope, it's, you're wasting your time. You know, it's kind of it's kind of difficult question to answer without actually uh, seeing the conditions that you're talking about. I mean, during the growing season, like seeing it now, even now is not really useful. You want to see it during March, April, and 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 onward. Uh, but I will tell you that zoysia is not some magic grass where you can like stick it in like four hours of sunlight and it's going to look amazing, whereas Bermuda will not. It still needs still needs a lot of sunlight. Even zoysia, even though it's more shade tolerant than, than Bermuda, it will look like the more sunlight you give it, the better it's going to look. So take that for what you... um what you will. All right, CPM says, luckily my channel has already been established for six years, just adding some lawn care content to it. I definitely think it's gonna be fun. Very cool, Colin, I like it. I like it, I like it, I like it. Um, he says, let Lee know I'll be down for the weekend of the 13th would be good. I don't think it's gonna be the weekend of the 13th. I know if it's in April, I know that I'm, I can't say for sure, but I am fairly confident the week of the 13th is not when it's gonna be. I'm fairly confident that that's not when the, um, the turf park party is gonna be. It's likely gonna be after that. But again, let, let Lee tell you, but I'm pretty sure it's gonna be after the, the week of the 13th. Um, Troy Smalley says, is there a broadleaf killer uh, that won't kill bees for hay fields? That's a good one. Um, I mean, I, I, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know, Troy. Like, I mean, there's Celsius, there's Triad, like there's like any three way that are great broadleaf um, herbicides. I don't, I've not, that's a good question. I've never heard of those herbicides having a negative impact against bees. Normally when you're worried about bees, it's the, it's insecticide. So like if you're using like, um, like for example, one of the benefits of like a, a insecticide, like, um, like a celeprin is that it's safe for invertebrates like earthworms and also for, or, or it's a safer for invertebrates like earthworms and uh, pollinators like bees. I've not heard about, um, like herbicides, like a like a like a broadleaf herbicide, like Celsius or or like any other three way, like having a negative effect against bees. It might be. I've just never heard. I've never heard of that. So it's hard for me to to answer um, to answer your question. Normally, with that kind of thing, with that kind of question, it's normally insecticides that you got to be careful with. Like which ones are you trying to use? Like using like my or using something else that could negatively impact um, like insects that you don't want to get injured. But I've not really heard that. With um, with herbicides, I don't know. But you know what? I'm going to do some research on that. And if you, I'm not sure if you're going to be back here next week, but I'll do some digging. But I, I'm inclined to think that as long as you're like not spraying their their, I don't know if they have a hive or not. But as long as you're you're spraying in and you're limiting the spray to the plant that you're that you're trying to target, that it should be okay. Um, because I, I reading the labels, I don't ever recall seeing anything about um 
about like pollinators or bees for when it comes to herbicides. Again, might be wrong on that though. So let me do some digging on it and maybe i will be a talking point for next week. Great question. Keith Madison is up next. He says, uh, good evening, Ron. It's been a while since I have been on to watch live. I've dropped in to tell you, thank you for so much for helping our community. You're very welcome. I appreciate it, man. He says, we appreciate you and let's get those likes up off the lawn thirds, not lawn nerds. Really means a lot, uh, Keith. Thank you so much, man. Cause uh, you know, it's a, it's a labor of love. I enjoy doing it. I learn a lot from you guys. It's a fun way to pass a Friday night. And uh, yeah, I'm glad you guys get some value out of it and you can get better looking lawns because of um, of the info. So glad you guys, you guys watch the content and that you like it. All right, uh, next up is, uh, let me go here. So next up I have Dick Nasty uh, Motorsports. He says, thanks Ron, uh, uh, it's the M, that's the M4. Uh, been, I need to find a new way to attach a, re a reel to it. The AC would make the summer mowing legit. Uh, very cool. Uh, let me see here. Thanks, Ron. Uh, the, that's the picture in my profile pic. I need to do a, a real mod to it and turn it into a mower. Summer mowing would be a freeze. I appreciate the IG love. Yeah, man, I gotta tell you, here's the thing, McNasty. So BMW is kind of hit and miss, man. Like the new M4, I gotta tell you, like from the, the grill is either a love it or hate it. I'm still, the new, the grill on the new M4, I, I'm trying to like it. it. I mean, it looks more muscular, but it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of grill is what I'm trying to say. But the back, like the three, the rear three quarters on that car is just, it's a sight to behold. I was in, I was in Publix the other day and I saw one roll up and they parked and I was like, man, that looks mean. I mean, this is just like a, that's like off the, off the showroom floor. This is not even getting stamps or putting some wheels on it or anything. It's just, just as it, as it comes from, from the factory. Um, but the front end, man, just, I don't, I, you probably, maybe you like it, but it's, it's just a, it's, I don't know. I know what they're thinking. They're, they're, they're going, it's like almost a competition to see who can put the biggest grill on cars these days. I don't, I don't get it, but the back looks awesome. Back and side profile, thing of beauty. Thing of beauty. All right. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, next up is, make, let me see what else we got here. We got Jeremy Wynn. He says, um, hey, new to the channel. What's going on, Jeremy? Thanks for coming in. I appreciate you being new to the channel and uh, and supporting, and hopefully you get some value out of it. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat, and I'll do my best to help you out. All right, and then next up is Gavin Moore. He says, hey, Ron, are those spray tips universal, or are they just for a particular sprayer? I have a Chapin backpack sprayer. Yeah, they tend to be universal, uh, Gavin. You can swap them, like the, like the same spray tips that I use on my Yard Mastery sprayer, I can use on my Chapin or the Flow Zone. You can, they tend to be, yes, you tend to be able to swap the nozzle um, if you have one of those spray tips. So yeah, if, assuming you have one, a sprayer where the nozzle is changeable, which most of them are, then you should be good to go. You can you can interchange them without without issue. That's why I gave you guys the links in case you don't have that sprayer. You can buy those spray tips and whatever sprayer you have, you can you can make it work. Because really, oh, look, I, I love, I really like the sprayer that, I, that I'm using. Like the Yardmaster sprayer is a great sprayer because it comes with pretty much everything you need. But when it comes to getting a great result with a, um, when it comes to spraying liquid products using a backpack sprayer, it really is a case of it's more the Indian rather than the Arrow. So yes, is the, is the, the spray that we carry on the Golf Force Lawn Store, is it a great sprayer? Yes, is it, I mean, was the one that I'd recommend? Absolutely. Um, but you can get great results using other sprayers as long as you calibrate them properly, you use the right spray tip. So it's, um, it, it's again, it's really more the Indian, really more the Indian than the Arrow. If you know what you're doing, you can get good results with really any sprayer. Um, but it's for someone that's brand new and is like saying, hey, I just wanna buy one thing and not have to worry about it. It's gonna come with everything I need and it's gonna be well built, high quality. That's not gonna break on me. I'm just gonna be good to go. Then buy that one. That's the one that I'd recommend for that reason. All right, JA is up next. He says, sir, I plan on leveling my lawn soon. What sand slash organic material combo do you recommend to level? Thanks in advance. Great question, JA. I like a combination of 70% sand and 30% organic material of some sort. So that can be topsoil or compost. Uh, the reason for that is the sand adds structure, meaning it's good for leveling, for getting those uneven spots out of the lawn. And then the compost or topsoil is, is good organic material to help improve the soil profile. So that's why I like to use a, a combination of, of sand and soil. A 70-30 blend is what I like to go with. I'll give you a link here in the chat, assuming you live in Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Alabama, or Tennessee. Super Sod has a level mix that is exactly that, it's 70-30. Um, it's a great product, it's what I use on my lawn, and um, that code will save you $5 off of any other incentives that are currently running. So, uh, so I hope that helps, sir. Um, it's, um, again, you can do 100% sand, and that's okay, but I, for, for most people, I try and tell them, hey, go go with a blend, 70-30 mix. 
another option too, it's more work, is you could get like 100% sand and you could use, you could introduce organic material yourself. So you could use a product like Carbonized PN. So something like this, if you go to shop and then go to Mirror Mission Green Biostimulants, you've got this guy right here. So Carbonized PN, this is a great option um, to use as a, as an, as a, the organic co um, component of a top dressing mix. So you can, you can just top dress your lawn completely with this, but it's, that's just top dressing. It's not for leveling work. I would not use this if your goal is to level. If, you're, if your goal is just to improve the quality of the soil, um, then yes, Carbonized PN, excellent product. But if your goal is to level, then I would not use this just by itself. You could take this and mix it with, um, with sand, and then you can make your own leveling mix. If you're looking for a whole lot of it, we make it, we also have it available in Super Sacks. I can find it, I think it's on the next page. So you can get Carbonized PN and Essential G in a 2,000 pound Super Sack. This is the equivalent of 50 pounds or 50 bags. So this is, you actually save quite a bit going this route. If you're doing a big top dressing project and you're gonna be doing a lot of the, the, the making the material, the mix yourself. So it's, you know, again, it's 50 pounds, 50 bags, 2,000 pounds. It's equivalent of, um, it's, this is the way to go if you're doing a lot of leveling and you're gonna make your own top dressing material. So we've got that for both Carbonized PN or Essential G. So uh, so there you go. Hope that helps, JA, as far as um, what I would do for um, for leveling for leveling mix. And hopefully my, my logic makes sense. Also, let me get you that link for the top dressing before I forget. So here we go. Uh, da, 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 da. And again, it's it's kind of nice that they um that that Superside partnered with us to, and they're always running in they're always running incentives, they're always running sales. So like right now, I'm looking at their website. It's like thirty dollars off any big yellow bags. So if you use this discount code, it'll save you another five dollars off of that thirty dollars. So thirty five bucks off, a little bit, but it still helps, right? Every bit helps. So at J A, uh, there you go. Um, leveling mix. So this is the stuff that I would use. And uh, I appreciate the question, sir. Hopefully it was useful for you. All right. Uh, next up is Archie Amos. Great question. He says, is there an argument to be made for Primo versus Tenex? Yeah, so the, the active ingredient in both products is the same. So it's Trinexapac ethyl in both Primo and, um, and Tenex. I've asked this question to... Um, my rep at Syngenta, and they said the difference, the biggest difference is in the carriers. So the others, the, the other stuff that's in Primo other than um, other than the Trinexapac ethyl, other than the active ingredient, that is what's different. So for example, um, Syngenta makes uh, Primo, and I think they also make a product um, called Podium. I think they also make Podium. I believe that's right. And the difference between them is the consistency from batch, not that there's anything wrong with Podium, but the consistency from batch to batch is tighter with Primo. In other words, if you, if you buy a batch of Primo like today and you buy one next year, like the formulation is gonna be, it's gonna be exactly the same. And not saying that that that, that TNX is not that way too, but the the quality of the um, the carriers, the other stuff other than um, the the Shrexapac ethyl is what is what the differences are. So I've done, I've used TNX, I've used Primo. I like the results I have on my lawn with, with Primo. I've used both of them. I've, in the past, if you go back and look at my videos from long enough, from far back, you've seen videos of me. It's like some of my first videos were talking about using uh, TNX in the lawn. And it, it produces good results, um, but I like I like what I get with um, with Primo. Like I've been using Primo for the past few years and I really like the results that I, I get with it, so, which is why I use it. And if you, what, you, if you, what you'll find is um, part of it is uh, you know, Devin, I'm not sure if he's on here, is that they also offer like, um, like as far as like golf courses, like they won't, they're not going to use like professional turf fields. They um, are going to use Primo. They're not going to use like, like TNX or anything like that. Because if there's a problem, like say they get a bad batch or something like that, like Syngenta will, will take, they can go to, to the manufacturer and say, hey, listen, we applied this at the correct rates and we got, we, you know, got some damage. So that's, so for that reason, um, you'll find that professional, like people that, that, that take care of turf grass for a living tend to stick with, um, with, with Primo versus using like TNX or some of the other um, off-brand products that have, to, to have the same active ingredient, but isn't made to the same standards that Primo is. So, Hopefully that makes sense, um, Archie. You can get great results with either one of them, but Primo is the one that I um, I like and I use. So hopefully that makes sense to you. All right, so I got a super chat. Actually, let me run down here really quick. 
have us, um, let's see here, we have um, from Archie another question and then I'll grab the super chat really quick. He says, can the pest control be used in a fogger? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. That's actually how I recommend using it. As far as coverage, I think you, you get something like 7,000 square feet of coverage per gallon if you use a fogger versus like 1,500 square feet of coverage if you use like a sprayer. So it, it goes a lot further if you use a fogger and in the product description, if you look at the video where I show using the product, I'm using a fogger. You know what I mean? So it's it's absolutely on the label. There are mixing instructions for um, backpack sprayers and foggers. And if you have access to a fogger, that is what I would um that's what I would use. It's also nicer for whenever you're spraying like gutters or spraying like shrubs. It just it does a nice job being able to really penetrate and do a nice job covering everything. So yes, to answer your question, foggers are absolutely a um, an approved application method for the um, for the Miramichi pest control. Absolutely a uh, approved method. So, um, so yes. And again, if you if you look so how I did it, that's uh, that's the video that um, that's the, the method that I used. All right, so we have a super chat. Let me run down here really quick. This one is from Sean Campbell. Thank you so much for the super chat, Sean. Super chat received. And I think you have a follow up question as well. Do you not? I think so. Let's find it. Let me let's scroll down here and see where you are. Yep, here we go. Uh, Yes. Um, so this one is from Sean. He says, oh, you mentioned using two types of pre-immersion. I am using prodiamine in a split application for the spring. What do you think of FO4 SE in the fall? I have a cool season lawns fighting poenua. I don't know. I've never, today's the first day I've ever heard of that pre-immersion, Sean. I don't, let me look at it so I can find it really quick. I don't know what, um, I've never heard of that, that pre-immersion to, to be able to tell you anything about it. Etho. Etho four, mm, I've um, I've not heard of that one. I'm actually looking for it. And I'm not, I'm not seeing it. Uh, Etho, is that is that the actual name for it? Pre-emergent. Um, oh, Etho four C. Uh, 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 uh. It's a it's a pre and post-emergent. Yeah, I've not. Um, yeah, I don't know that. I don't know too much about this. What what is the active ingredient? in this. Um, I don't I don't know that much about it, Sean, so I can't tell you for sure whether or not it would be a good fit. I don't even know if it's labeled for use on, is it labeled for use on residential on? It says, yeah, pre and post emergent control of Poanio for both cool, see, for in both cool season turf grasses. Okay, so, uh, so yeah. Um, I'm looking here, I don't see if it's set. What is the active ingredient, does it say? what it is, I don't know. Um, I, I have to look and see what the, um, I don't know what the active ingredient in, in it is. Uh, I'm looking here at other, other, other pages to see if I can figure out what they, um, well, yes, the active ingredient is you know, ethofumicate. Okay, yeah, so again, I, the first time I've ever heard of this, I don't, I don't know, I don't know. I've never, I've never, uh, today's the first time I've even heard of this particular product, so I don't, um, I don't know how well it would um, it would work. How well it would work. So, if you've got um, if you can do some research, I'll do some digging into it as well because I get something else that I can uh, I can new for me to learn, um, and I can I can get back to you. But I don't. I've never used it before. I've never even heard of it until you just um, you just mentioned it. So I can't say how well it would work for um, for controlling POA. According to the label, like all the branding says, it's like awesome for controlling POA anyway. So. It might do the trick, but I'm not, I can't tell you from direct experience um, how well it would work. And you said Renault's last fall used tenacity, but it didn't realize it only lasts a short time as pre-emergent. Yeah, so so yeah, so if you're saying in comparison to, to tenacity, then yes, like any any other pre, any other like true pre-emergent, like Prodiamine, Dimension, this product you're talking about, Etho4, um, is likely gonna have a lot, is not likely, is going to have a lot longer residual than tenacity will. Um, but as far as how well this product works, I can't say for sure. So again, I've never, I've never used it. So, um, so sorry, I'm not more help on that. I appreciate the super chat. I'll do some digging into it, and if you want, we can chat about it. If you come back on next week, we can chat about it, and I can, um, I can give you my thoughts. And you said, what other pre-emergence would you use as the second? So here's the thing. You said you have what kind of grass do you have? That's really important. Um, yeah, you need to say what kind of grass you have. So if you have warm season grass, what I would use is prodiamine or dithiopyr in the spring. 
and in the fall, I would use spectacle. Like, yeah, but this is only for warm season grass. If you got like Kentucky bluegrass or fescue or ryegrass, do not use this. You can't use this on those on those grass types. So if you have a warm season lawn, then this is what I would go. But you said no, you said I have five cool season lawns. I just I just saw your comment. So I have cool season lawns and I'm finding POA. So yeah, so maybe this this Etho four this Etho four product is the way to go. Um, for warm season turf, this is what I would say, but this is not going to be any help for you because you got cool season grass. I just saw that in your comments. So uh, let me do some digging on it. I'll I'll, um, I'll do some reading up on it and find out if it's um you know what see what people are saying about it. it that might be the uh, that might be the the trick. Might be the way to go. Uh, so um so yeah. Sorry, I'm not more help on this one, but um I will I will dig into it and get back to you. If you want, um you can send me an email here, Ron at golfcourselawn.com. Um, so I feel like I kind of, oh, you gave me a super chat, right? So I want to make sure I give you as good answers as I can. Send me an email, say, hey, this is Sean from the live stream. And when I do some digging into it and talk to um, some of my friends in the industry and find out what their thoughts are on it, I'll write you back and say, hey, this is what this is what the thoughts are. But again, I've not used it personally. I'm going to be giving you information that based on um, some pros that I know that that um, that take care of cool season turf and that have likely used that product. So it sounds like it's something that's more for cool season grass than uh, than warm season because I've not, I've not heard of it being used around in these parts. Thank you for the super chat. I really appreciate it. All right. Uh, next up, we have, let's see here. Next up, we have um, uh, Jimmy. He says, does the Earth 2050P have an edge guard system? Yes, it does have, it does have a way to close off one of the holes in the hopper so you're not throwing material. I forget which side. It, it closes off one of the sides. I forget which one. Um, so it's not, um, it's not like a, like a like what the Scott spreader has like the like the edge guard where it doesn't um, like a barrier, but it it basically you will not throw to one side of the spreader if you close off one of the uh, the doors underneath. So yeah. All right. Next up is King Kong. He says, "What's going on, everyone? Not too much King Kong hanging in there, man. Living the dream, you know. Talking about grass, getting tough questions, getting roughed up. You know, some of these guys, some of the questions tonight are a little tough. You know." So. Makes me better. Having fun, having fun while I'm at it. Hopefully you are doing well, sir. Appreciate you coming in to say hi. And then Real Rollers is in the live stream. Says, "Am I late? You're all. You, this is this is your thing, right? It's your modus operandi. You're like fashionably late. You know, now that you're here, people are going to be asking you all kinds of questions about the revolution. So, guys, like Lee from Real Rollers is in the live stream. I'm not sure how much longer he's going to be in, but um, if you have any questions about the mower, he would be the guy to uh, to ask. He knows more than I know. He knows more than I know." Uh, let's see. Um, it says, do you have a section on your website where we can calculate how much nitrogen or pre-emergent we have applied to help us not overapply our product and cause root stunt? Yeah. So the way to no, because you really don't need a calculator to do that. <laughs> like what you would, what you would do is up like stick with the label rates. Like the label gives you all the info you really need to not overapply the product. So, um, so yeah, like if, like with prodiamine, for example, if you have warm season grass, like 0.83 ounces for warm season turf, like Bermuda, Zoysia, I think St. Augustine too, is your annual limit. And in a 12 month period, do not apply more than that to your lawn. And you're not going to, then you're not going to, you shouldn't have any adverse effects uh, if you do that. When it comes to nitrogen inputs um, for Bermuda grass, you know, the conventional wisdom says a pound of nitrogen per month whenever the grass is actively growing. What I do and teach is a bit less than that. So I apply about seven tenths of a pound of nitrogen to my lawn when it's actively growing. The reason why I get away with that, Jimmy, is because I do, um, I have like a, a biosimilar to a big part of how I run my lawn care program. And that helps me get more out of the fertilizer that I do apply. And, uh, and yeah, then you're good to go. As far as the only calculator that we really have on the store is for questions that I get from people with saying, hey, how much of this product do I need? And because it, you know, I get that question all the time. I said, you know what? I'm just going to build a logic into a tool. So if you go to shop and then lawn fertilizer and then calculate my program, or you go up to resources and you go to lawn fertilization calculator, this will tell you based on your lawn size, let's say a 4,000 square foot lawn. And it will, you know, basically you got warm season grass or cool season grass, um, whether or not you want to do spoon feeding or not, whether you have need phosphorus or not. Let's say you do just for, just for kicks and giggles. Let's say you just want that. Um, do you need growth regulator? Of course. And do you want a granular biosimilant like Essential G? You can follow that and it will spit out a recommendation for you saying one bag of this fertilizer, here's the carbon kit, Primo and Essential G. So th this will build out like a program for you 
based on the size of your lawn. But as far as like, like how much to apply to prevent over applying it, that's what the label is for. So as long as you follow the label and you apply it properly, like if you, use a, if you apply liquids using a calibrated backpack sprayer or you, or you apply granular products, using a properly grant, uh, uh, calibrated like broadcast spreader, meaning you did like the, the, the process that I spoke about earlier this evening as far as figuring out like what settings you need to have to put down X pounds of product over a thousand square feet. If you do those things, then you're not gonna over apply products. You're gonna be good to go. You know what I mean? So that is, um, that is how I would go about it. Like ca a calculator to tell you like how much nitrogen or pre that you can apply is just, that's just the, I mean, it's, it's it's giving you a number, but if you don't actually apply it properly, it doesn't mean anything. In other, in other words, like it's saying do this, like, you know, apply this much nitrogen. Doesn't really matter if the tool or the tools you're using aren't set up properly or if you're not using the tools properly to apply that much nitrogen. Same thing when it comes to pre-emergent. Saying you need this much pre-emergent doesn't really matter unless you have your your sprayer calibrated properly to apply the correct amount of pre-emergent or your broadcast spreader set up to apply the correct amount of pre-emergent. So it's more, I would focus your time more on like reading the label and then making sure your equipment is set up properly. You're using it properly to be able to, to correctly apply the right amount of product over the desired square footage. That's, that's how I would go about it. Okay, next up is James Smith. He says, wait, Ron, where's our LG tonight? He's probably busy. You know, it's not, we don't have any giveaways tonight. You know, LG, he's just kind of fickle like that. You know, he, he comes out whenever... Whenever there's something big going on, he might be busy. He might be on vacation. You know, he does that too. You know, maybe he's moved on. Maybe we're just not, we're not good enough for him anymore. It could be that too. I don't want to think that, but it could be, could be. Um, McNasty says, Ron, not a fan of the pig nose BM. See, I didn't want to call it that, but it's just, it's like, it, you know what his problem is? It's like, it's like you had two design engineers fighting over the car and they said, okay, look, you get to design the front of the car and I'm gonna do the rest of it because we still gotta sell these things. You can do your experiment on the front and I'm gonna do the, the rest of it. And the one, the engineer or the team of engineers that did the side and back did a much better job than the ones that did the um, the front. It's kind of like, not, again, not to throw shade. It's almost like the Corvette, not to, <laughs> I'm, I'm opening a can of worms here. It's almost like the Corvette, like the new Corvette. Like if you look at that car, the front, gorgeous. The side, gorgeous. The back of the car, I don't understand it. I understand what they try and they try and keep the same tail lights because they're trying to keep. Hey, this is like the Corvette tail lights. This is the, the way it's got to look. But the back part of the car, man, it really looks like like there's the, more could have been done with it. Like go go look at what Ferrari and McLaren and all these other mid engine people like Porsche. Go look what they do. They all build great mid engine cars where the front and the back looks good. But the core of the new Corvette, and again, maybe I'm probably in the minority on this, but the front of the new Corvette, beautiful side profile, awesome. Look at the back of it. Hmm. Yeah, it's like the Panamera, like the new Por like the Porsche Panamera when it first came out, it was a big miss. Now the Porsches fix it to where the back looks good. But when the Panamera first came out, man, it was not, it was not a thing. It was not a good looking car, at least the back part of it. But again, I'm I'm probably in the minority about it. But I mean, you know, you know, I'm not a designer. I'm not I'm not a car designer, so I probably don't understand the the ethos of what they were going for. So I just know what looks good to my eye, and there you go. That's what I'm sharing. All right, moving on. Uh, next up, we have uh, uh, Real Rollers. He's talking to Bill. And then um, Sam is up. Uh, he says, uh, Bill, it was a pleasure meeting your wife. Offered a tour and test drive, but she seemed happy to know we were real folks. She was sweet. All right, next up is Sam. He says, I need to reseed my backyard, which seed is the best Bermuda seed I can use. Hmm. Um, I am in Central Texas, if that helps. Okay, so... Here's what I would say, Sam. Um, as far as Bermuda grass seeds, in my opinion, the best Bermuda grass seed you can't get anymore, which is a product called, it's a cultivar called um, Arden 15. It's a great Bermuda grass seed. It it like really approaches the the look and texture of a of a um, of a high Bermuda grass. Awesome product. I don't know why they discontinued it. Uh, but as far as, um, as as other grass seeds, you can use like Yukon Monaco. Those are like um, I mean, a lot of people like to refer to them as improved commons. They look nice. Uh, but what I would tell you is this. If I can convince you to not do seed, I that's the way I would try and push you to. Like, if you can decide to not do grass seed and go towards resodding your back lawn, I really think you're going to like the results you get better for a couple of reasons. Hear me out on this. 
when it comes to Bermuda sod, you have access to, I think, a lot nicer cultivars of Bermuda. Like you got like Tiff Tough, Tiff Green, you got the new Tahoma 31, even Tiffway 419, all great cultivars of Bermuda grass. Um, and you will literally go from, like, say, once you do all the prep work and you, you know, you, you, you kill off your existing lawn, you go to the process of actually getting ready to, um, to do the, to lay the new sod, you will go from no lawn to lawn literally in a day or so. Whereas with grass seed, a lot of people look at a, a bag of grass seed and say, oh, this is like, you know, 50 bucks or hundred bucks. This is way cheaper than doing sod. And it looks that way, but really by the time you factor in all the prep work and then the amount of water, that's the big thing most people don't factor in, the amount of water that you have to apply to the lawn for two to three weeks to get Bermuda to germinate, um, it, it almost becomes a wash. And then the thing also to keep in mind is that if you seed or you try and grow a Bermuda lawn from grass seed, it doesn't always grow in, or I should say better answer is it rarely grows in all evenly through all parts of the lawn. So you're going to have some areas that are going to grow in a bit faster. Some areas that are going to be thinner. Some areas you may have to reseed. So it's just, it's, it's, it's a, um, it's more of a process to grow a, a lawn from grass seed versus just going with sod. So I, I try and steer people towards sod because one, you have way cooler, options like as far as like nicer like a like visually apparent um, from a visual appearance and just um cold tolerance just like all the benefits you get from like a hybrid bermuda grass that you get in a sod um that you don't necessarily get in a lot of the improved commons so for that reason i would really try and tell you go with sod instead of set of seed but if you decided hey i wanted to do hard mode and i still want to do sod i'm sorry i want to do seed look into like yukon or monaco or, um, or call Hancock Seed in, I think they're in Lakeland, Florida, call them up and say, hey, I'm looking to get some Bermuda grass seed. What's the new hotness? What do you recommend? I'm in, I'm in uh, Texas. What do, you, what do you think I should go with? And they're going to give you a bunch of options, the pros and cons, stuff they're selling a lot of, the feedback they're getting, that kind of thing. But I would still tell you, go with sod. Get sod. Like, um, there's also some good sod farms. I think like Four Points Turf is in Texas, they have Tahoma 31. So you, there's lots of places in Texas where you can get Tahoma 31. And that, again, that's what I would do if I were redoing a lawn. So hope that helps. I have beat that horse to death. Hopefully I've convinced you to go the sod route versus the seed route, but it's ultimately up to you. All right. Um, my lawn story says, my soil test um, said that all NPK levels are low. Start of the season, I plan to apply... Oh, I'm going to sneeze. I plan to apply one pound of N with the stress that transitions to the complete later. In May, I'll do half a pound of stress and then half a pound of the complete. Thoughts? Uh, I mean, why not just use the complete? Like, if, if all your NPK levels are low, why not just use the fertilizer that has all of them? You know what I mean? I you mean, I, I don't... Could you do what you're doing and send it, have it work? Sure. But why not just use the one product? Like, why just, just use the complete 14714 and just apply it... Like on the bag, there's a rate, there are spreader settings for like half a pound of N per month or half a pound of N per application and 0.9, so, not, so practically a pound of N per application. So just go with the 0.9 uh, calibration and just apply that. So I would just, that's what I would do on my lawn story. I wouldn't mix and match the stress and the, I would just, just do the one. I would just do the, the complete 14714. That is what I would roll with given that you say that you're, like all your macros are low. That's what I would do. All right, um, next up is Aaron Fleck. He says, why do they limit pre-emergent? Is it bad for the lawn or are they more concerned about lakes and streams? Probably a bit of all of the above, Aaron. So if you over apply pre-emergent, it, um, it can damage the roots. It could damage the ability for the, if you have like a, a creeping grass like Bermuda, it can, it can limit the ability for it, for it to tack down, for the stolons to tack down when the runners will go over the lawn. Um, and it's just not, um, like more is not necessarily better. Like everything, pretty much everything in life is, has limits to it, right? Like we think about drinking water, water is good for you to drink. Drinking a lot of water is good for you, but at certain levels, even drinking water becomes toxic. So it's the same thing with like herbicides, fertilizer, anything you apply to an organic living thing, there are limits to where you're in the Goldilocks zone where things are good. And then when you go above that, you start to get to the point where it's less good and then move to the point of damaging or toxic. So um, so yeah, that's the reason why there's limits on pre-emergent and why there's limits on pretty much everything that we apply to our lawns to protect the grass and also to protect the environment. So, uh, so I hope that helps. Good question. 
that's a good one, Aaron. Um, but yeah, just stick to the label. I mean, think about it. Think about it from this standpoint, right? Like the companies that make pre-emergent, like they are m very motivated to sell as much of the product as they can because that's how they make money, right? So if they're telling you, hey, use only this much of the product, then you should stick to that because if they, if you could use as much of it as you absolutely wanted to, um, then, you know, especially, especially when it comes to, like when it comes to, to herbicides, insecticides, fertilizers, you really want to stick to the, to the, to, to the labels. I mean, to, to what they, the recommendations are. When you start getting into like organic products, like uh, if you're talking about compost or um, those types of product, like you'd be hard pressed to apply too much of them. I mean, obviously you can apply too much for your smothering the lawn, but organic products, uh, you tend to have a lot more flexibility around application without causing damage to the lawn or the environment because the products are, are organic versus synthetic products, again, like fertilizers, herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, uh, those types of things. So the label, the, the limits are there for a reason. You wanna, you really wanna follow them. So next up is uh, McNasty. He says, man, Ron, speak my language. The C8 is the epitome of design by committee. Awful, and I've had a few in my past. Yeah, I mean, the front looks good. The side looks good, but the back, man, I just don't, I, mm -mm. I don't know, maybe the C9 will be better. And again, I love America, love American cars, love American muscle, but um, Chevy, go back to the back of this of this Corvette. You guys can do better. I know you can, I know you can. I mean, look what Ford did with the GT. I mean, that shows you when, when you, when you have like a, like someone that is able to control the pen, the design pen from beginning to end, from nose to tail, like you can build something that's beautiful. So American car manufacturers should absolutely do it. Like the Ford GT is a thing of beauty, but the, um, like the, for the Corvette, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know what they what they did with the new one, but whatever. Anyone that has Corvettes, sorry if I'm offending you, but I mean, that's just my thoughts, and I'm an expert on my opinion. All right, Higgy Pop says, I am late to the party, happy Friday, and then next up is James Smith. He says, lastly for the night, what's the Chick-fil-A mix for the night? I already know it's not a 50-50 something. Actually, there's no Chick-fil-A tonight. This is just Milo's, um, uh, their Arnold Palmer. That's all it is, and water. So like half, like, like halfway with water, and then um, Arnold Palmer is what it is. So lemonade, their lemonade and and tea. That's what I'm drinking tonight. That's what I'm sipping on, man. And then next up is Higgy. He says, on the side of my house that does not get enough sun, I'm planning on adding some sod this season to help fill in the gaps. What type of Bermuda sod would you recommend? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. So here's the thing, Higgy. If grass, if Bermuda is not growing there and now, I, it's, it's probably not going to happen. I mean, you can try it. Here's the thing. You could, you, if it's a small area and you want to try it as an experiment, by all means, but if grass is not currently growing there, there's a reason for it. Like Bermuda uh, or Bermuda grass and sunlight um, are that like, you've got to have a lot of direct sunlight, like shade in Bermuda. I always say it's like ice cream and mayonnaise. They just don't go together. So you could, you could try it if you want. If it's a small area, I don't want you to go out and spending a bunch of money and then only to, to lose the sod. But if, um, but pretty much if grass is not growing there now, there's a reason for it. And you going out and getting, you know, Bermuda sod, fresh Bermuda sod is, is unlikely to really change that. What will probably happen is you'll put it down and it might grow in, it'll green up a little bit and then it'll just die off. Like, and it'll start looking like how that area looks now. So your choices are to use a different type of grass, like maybe a fescue would work well in there. Or if it's a small enough area, maybe make it something decorative, like put some shrubs in or rock garden or something, but it's, um, Bermuda needs all the sunlight, like as much sunlight as it can get, the better it's going to look. So I wouldn't, I really wouldn't want you to, to go in there with high expectations of putting Bermuda sod in an area of the house, like by your admission, that doesn't get enough sun. It's, I think you're going to be throwing money away personally. If you want to try it, you can, but I, I don't, I don't think it's going to, I don't think it's going to work out too well. So hope that, uh, hope that helps. Uh, James Kelly said, I had some damage and was wondering if I should wait until it grows back in before I start PGR this year on my Tucky Bluegrass. When should I start PGR back up this year for the rest of this for the rest of the lawn? That's a great question, James. So you know, if you've got damage to the lawn, um, wait for it to grow in, wait for it to heal and recover. Wait till you're mowing it till you like how the lawn is looking, and then if you want to introduce uh, Primo at that point, then by all means. But yeah, if, it, if it's already thin and not doing well, like limiting its ability to grow is probably not the best idea. So I would wait until it 
it's growing in and doing well before you introduce Primo. It's hard to say like when you should actually do that because I haven't seen the lawn. I don't know what it looks like or you know when your lawn, particular lawn tends to wake up throughout the year. But um, you know when it's doing well and when you're mowing it and it's filling in nicely. And at that point, that's when I would reintroduce a growth regulator. So uh, so yeah, yeah. It's, I, I wouldn't get along that's struggling. Uh, limiting its growth is um, is probably not what you um, what you want to do. What did, did the damage come from? You didn't say. Oh, you said mold damage. Um, yeah, but the thing is, mold damage shouldn't take that long to recover from. Um, James, I mean, they, they did some tracks through, but that shouldn't that shouldn't be bad. That really shouldn't be um, that really shouldn't be too bad. I mean, I haven't, if you're talking about like one like like one mold track, then it's probably not going to make a big difference. You're talking about like they like they did your entire lawn or it looks like a construction site, then. You know, maybe let the lawn heal a little bit before you go, before you go the route of um, of doing that. So it, without seeing the lawn, it's it's hard to say. But mold tracks tend to be you know, I don't know four inches wide and not you know. So depending on how bad it is, that will dictate how long you're going to want to wait before you um before you introduce any kind of growth regulator. So, but it shouldn't it shouldn't take long for the lawn to bounce back from that, man. Shouldn't be too bad. All right. Uh, Next up, you uh, we have Jimmy Miller. He says, it seems I recall you talking about a product you can use to kill grubs and use for fungus control, but I cannot remember the name of the product. I need a granular form. It kills, and something that kills ants too. Yeah, so what you're, gonna, what you're talking about, Jimmy, I'm not sure about the ants part of it, but what you're referring to is a product called Caravan G. So if you go to shop and insecticide fungicide, you will see Caravan. So this is a combination insecticide and fungicide. The um, fungicide in it is azoxystrobin. Yeah, it's not propiconazole. Yeah, it's, it's azoxystrobin that's in this. Um, and it also has an insecticide. So as far as being able to control grubs and also prevent uh, common lawn diseases like, um, you know, brown patch, uh, those types of things, large patch, those kinds of, those kinds of uh, lawn diseases, it's a good option. The time of year when I would say to apply this would be in, um, in May. May time frame. So, uh, so yeah, Caravan G is the product you're talking about. So I'll, um, I'll send you a link to that, Jimmy, to where you can pick uh, that up if you're so inclined at Jimmy Miller, um, right there. And, uh, this is, this is Caravan G. That's, that's, that's what I believe you're talking about. That's the combination, uh, insecticide and, um, fungicide. Well, guys, gals, I think that is it. I think that's all we have this evening. No saved rounds on Instagram. And uh, hopefully you guys got some, some value out of the show. If, if anything, Lisa was hopefully entertaining. If you've not applied your pre-immersion as yet, please go out and get, it, get that down, especially if you're in the Southeast United States. Um, we're going to have some new options that are going to become available for sale here um, early next week. So if you go to the Golf Horse Lawn Store, go to the, to the Weed Killer section, the pre-immersion section, and you see um, the two, like the Prodimine and the Dimension that are currently sold out, just add your name to that list. And as soon as I set it live for sale, which will be early next week, you'll get notified, you can pick it up, and uh, you'll be on your way to preventing weeds in your lawn, which is way better than having weeds in your lawn, right? Again, thank you guys so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. Um, it really means a lot that you guys take time out of your Friday evening to come hang out with me, and I will see you guys next week. Have an amazing weekend. Take care.